Messier. We're uh, just watching the end of WrestleMania here. Cody and Roman Reigns and uh, The Rock, Seth Rollins, are in this big tag team match. Uh, Roman just connected with a nice uh, Superman punch. Gets a two and a half. Cody kicks out. So this match is going a bit longer than I thought, um, which is good. It's good to have a nice, big, epic-filled main event. It looks like they're in the uh, final stages of this match, so I'll just babble a little bit until it ends. And, uh, you know, so far, so good. I would say this has been a, a good WrestleMania night one, maybe not a great one. I mean, if you remember that WrestleMania from several years ago, uh, maybe two or three years ago, that ended with Steve Austin and Kevin Owens at the end of night one. And then the uh, second night had uh, McMahon and uh, Pat McAfee and, and Austin came out again. I think that was two years ago, wasn't it? So that was really a great well, night one. Here goes Roman for a spear, reverse into a sunset, two count. Uh, Cody gets up, ducks a clothesline. Cody mounts the ropes, nails a Cody cutter. Didn't really get the whole thing. Seth with a nice big frog splash. Be interesting if Seth got the pin. Seth gets a two and a half. Uh, really nice frog splash, though. They did play up that uh, they said that Roman Reigns is uh, battling leukemia right now. So... You know, they're kind of building in these excuses. They Earlier in the night, they did the same type of thing with Becky. They said that Becky had a 102-degree temperature this week. You know, who knows if this stuff is is real or part of the storyline. I mean, years ago, Lex Luger was in a match for the uh, NWA world title against Ric Flair on the Capital Combat pay-per-view, and they made a big deal about um, good old Lex having a temperature that week and having to drink fluids, and it actually turned out to be true, but he probably wasn't going to win that title that night anyway. Uh, so if you're live, this is, uh, or if you're here in live time, this is Saturday night, uh, 10.54 Eastern Standard Time. I'm watching uh, this WrestleMania. Seth now going for something, gets powerbombed for his trouble. Uh, Roman Reigns not only battling leukemia, uh, and good for him, but now he looks like he's got a bloody snout. snout bloody nose <clears throat> roman goes in for a spear gets punted cody comes in cody with kind of a mild super kick to the chest seth with a big super kick now a double super kick kind of uso style to roman uh seth is kind of going crazy in the corner nice curb stomp cody scoops in cody now with the uh crossroads gonna go for the pin here so you can get it one to oh referee got pulled out by the rock <clears throat> by the way have you noticed that the rock is the biggest guy in the match rock is about 51 years old something like that rock is about 50 and he looks better than all these guys to tell you the truth which was pretty apparent <laughs> at the beginning rock is bigger than his partner his cousin roman reigns rock is bigger bigger by far than cody and seth so anyway it kind of goes back to that king kong bundy quote that he shits bigger than Chris Jericho. Uh, Roman Reigns just caught Cody with a good old-fashioned low blow. Uh, Roman bounces off a spear. This could be it if the referee was around. The Rock throwing the ref back in. Here's the ref. One, two. Nope. Cody Cody gets a shoulder up. Uh, the Rock has really been great in this whole lead-up to WrestleMania. By the way, if you're watching in live time, you can comment. If you're watching on uh, Twitter or Facebook, you might have to Go to the actual YouTube page, the One Pro Wrestling and Sports Fan YouTube channel. Yes, I have more than one YouTube channel. I have about five. Uh, this is one of the most active ones. This is the former subscribe to Mike Messier YouTube channel, but I kind of split up my internet uh, uh, stuff just to make it a little bit easier for the viewer. Roman now, ooh, brutal step kick, kind of a step on the face of Cody. I do have a good friend of mine is at WrestleMania, a couple of them. My buddy uh, Tommy DiDucci and Jonathan Del Ponte are in Philadelphia live for this thing. Uh, they're somewhere uh, in there, and they're having a good time. And uh, Roman Reigns now has got a front face lock, kind of Hulk Hogan, uh, Richard Belzer style on Cody. Cody trying to get the momentum. It's interesting because Philadelphia is traditionally a heel town. A lot of heels get cheered in uh, Philadelphia, but the fans here at WWE have been kind of playing it by the book. They've been cheering Cody and Seth and and booing uh, Roman. So 
obviously there was a lot of good match matches on. Hey, my buddy, buddy uh, Jonathan, he's in uh, Pennsylvania there. Yeah, buddy, I I did enjoy that uh, experience last time with you guys coming and having the virtual party. The um, the uh, reception wasn't the best. It wasn't the worst, but it wasn't the best. And I'm, I'm just a guy that I like a nice, clear image. And uh, I did have a good time with you guys. Uh, I think me and Dr. Mike basically bored everybody with pro wrestling history or Maybe we entertained you, and, and who knows? I did hear uh, Dr. Mike was recently uh, got a shout out in the book, the Ric Flair audio book I just listened to uh, on Audible. So uh, Dr. Mike was actually uh, spoken of late in the book. He had a few nice quotes. Uh, Rocky just got tagged in. Uh, Jonathan, if you have any thoughts or uh, comments or questions about tonight's WrestleMania night one, I'll go through the match by match. But any opening statements you have, I'd love to hear them. We're still, uh-oh, so now we're doing some good stuff. Cody has just spotted Mama Rhodes with the weight belt. This is going to be funny. And there's Brandy's dad. Now now we're getting into some main event stuff. Cody, uh, I'm sorry, The Rock has got Cody's, the belt with the bull and the mama. I, the Rock is now whipping himself. <laughs> now he's... The Rock's getting into into it with Mama, Mama Rhodes. I don't know if that was a Rabira, like the steakhouse in Japan, because the uh, the mom there seemed to have a Brahma bull on her jacket. But I think it was the Rabira Steakhouse. That's the logo. So for the WWE fans, they might be very confused. Why did Cody's mom have a have a Rock jacket on? Cody now doing fist and fire. A little bit of the uh, the shuffle and elbow like his father. It's funny because Cody always wants to get out of his father's shadow, but when you're in WWE, that's part of the game. Okay, Cody in. Cody going it. Cody gets a nice spine buster. Uh-oh. The Rock now looks like he's going to do the people's elbow. This uh, The WWE has become very Rock-centric, as we've seen, with the Leah Le Mia Via and the the people's champion belt. I'm wondering if the rock is going to defend that championship belt. And no matter how this thing goes with Roman and uh, Cody, I do see Cody and the rock having a singles match, probably at SummerSlam rock just bounced off. Cody bounces off. Oh, Cody with a nice Cody uh, cutter. And is Cody going to pin this guy or what? It's hard to believe that this Cody Rhodes was the guy that was fighting with Sammy Quavera for the TNT title two years ago. Uh, jobbing to Malachi Black in two minutes of dynamite, all types of things that Cody did in uh, AW. Cody now lifting up the rock. Cody going for the Cody cutter, but look out. Here comes Seth with the big Superman. This could be it. Reigns has got a bloody nose. He's fighting leukemia. All types of fun stuff, Jonathan. And anyone else who's watching, I'm not sure if my friend uh, Ian Patrick Gagnon might be joining in. Jonathan, if you feel like putting your two cents in, buddy, I can put you the, I can send you the link if you want to get on camera and do some analysis with me. I'm always willing to share the mic with other intelligent wrestling fans. Uh, everyone's got their opinions about these things. Overall, it's been a fun night. Like I said, I don't think it was the blockbuster of two years ago with Austin and Owens, but this is this has been a good night. Okay, so Roman now is is doing his breathing dragon thing. It looks like he's going to hit the rock by mistake. Uh, I'm guessing that the rocks, yeah, so Roman just speared the rock. Okay, fair enough. You can kind of tell by the hesitation. <laughs> and oh, now Roman's check it out. Now what's going to happen here? Seth with the kick to the midsection. Cody with the kick to the midsection. Uh, Seth and Cody with double pedigrees. Is Seth going to get the pin? Nope. Double kick out. So this is going into extra innings. It looks like this match is going to end up being pretty long. I think we're going to hit the half hour mark. Good, good stuff. Good um, foreshadowing. If they ever do the Roman Rock match, uh, we saw a little foreshadowing of that, which was nice. Cody now talking to Seth Rollins. Let me crack my neck. Oh, that felt good. <sighs> Interesting day, folks. WrestleMania Saturday. 
it, it is kind of an interesting thing. I think that this is the first year. I think this is the fourth. Is this the fourth two night WrestleMania? Or maybe it's, I think it's the fifth actually. Oh, Cody and Seth doing a little hug. That's not going to end well. They're kind of psych each other up. Are they arguing? Looks like Seth has got a limp in his gullet here, a little limp in his uh, leg. Seth now going to the top rope. This probably is not going to end well. No, nope, it, it did okay. Did, Seth did a flying body splash. Don't know if Seth is actually selling the leg or if it's a real leg problem. It's hard to tell with these guys. Like I said, the money match here, folks, is The Rock and Cody Rhodes. If The Rock is, I mean, I gotta say, I, mean, I gotta give The Rock credit. He's 50 years old. He looks better than any of these guys. Uh, of the four, I gotta think that Cody or Seth is the oldest of the other three. Oh, The Rock drinking the water, spewing on Cody. Be good if he went over to Mama Rhodes and gave her a little taste of water, too. Uh, bonking Cody on the table, little old school, late 90s Spanish announce table stuff. Now Cody is, uh, The Rock is intimidating Brandy's father and The Rock's mom. That's funny. Be kind of interesting if together. I don't know if Brandy's parents are still together, but, you know, her father's there. And let's see here. The, the Rock, uh, he's got Cody on the table. This could be flipped around. Oh, look out. Seth Rollins grabbing an ankle. It rocks. The rock kicked off Seth like he's a wasp. Uh oh, Cody now. Oof, Cody with the rock bottom on the rock through the table. Those tables just break so easily. Uh, Roman with the nice spear through the barricade on Seth. This is a good tag match. I don't know if this is the greatest tag team match in WrestleMania history, but it, they're doing a good job. The match has picked up. I thought it would be over by now. That's why I started this uh, live telecast at 1045. Uh, but as far as um, what we got now is Cody is, is trying to get back into the ring. Yeah, that, that, it looks like they've mastered the art of the collapsible announce table. Because after 30 years of doing this, destroying tables, they've, they've figured out how to do it, apparently. Let's see. Uh, Cody is lifting up the rock. Going to roll him back in. Cody's going back in. The rock's already in. Oh, Seth came in with a nice, uh, the old, the old uh, punch on the canvas. He's got a name for that. I kind of forgot it. Let me know how my audio is, uh, fellas. If anyone's uh, out there and wants to comment, let me know if my my audio is fine. Another tag here to Roman. Roman, who sh we should all know, is battling leukemia as we speak. And I do feel for the guy if that's the case. Looks like Roman is holding his neck. Yeah, Roman, Roman uh, I don't know if it's just the power of uh, suggestion, but Roman does look a little bit smaller. I don't know if that's just comparison to The Rock, or has has Roman lost 10 or 15 pounds? I mean, he still looks great. It just looks like he's a little bit less, less Roman-y than usual. And uh, who knows? I mean, it looks like he's gone down a pant size or so. Uh, a little more streamlined physique. Doesn't look quite as small as the guy that played Kerry Von Eric in the Iron Claw. Uh, Roman now picking up Cody. A blocked punch. Cody with the punch. Roman with the punch. Uh, we're kind of doing that independent wrestling stuff now where two guys stand in the ring and just punch each other back and forth. Uh, Cody with a nice overhead. Roman with an overhead. Cody to one knee. Cody with the punch to the midsection. Uh, uppercut by Roman. Cody with the bounce off the ropes. Going for a Cody cutter once again. This time he actually did catch it. Uh, holds Roman, goes for, or he's going for another Cody cutter and gets it. So that's two. And now he's picking up good old Roman, looking for a third Cody cutter, but Roman gets him to the ropes. Rock with the whip of the belt. 
this actually is a really fun match. Um, Cody is now selling the uh, the whip. Good for him. Oh, Roman with the bounce off and the spear. And do we get our three count with this? We'll see. Who's our referee here? Is that is that uh, is it Jack Doan or it, it kind of looked like Mike Kyoto for a minute, but I think he's been gone. Roman. Oh, Rock demands the tag. Roman gives it to him. So Rock is not legal. It's not uh, by the way. Just look, just another guy that looks like Kyoto. Uh, whoever this ref is, he seems to be doing a fairly good job. Uh, the Rock now standing over Cody. He he wants to give him his his uh, whatever the fuck move. Let's see. Uh, yep. Rock hooks in Cody for a rock bottom. Cody knows it's coming, but he still gets the rock bottom. And now the the rock is looking around. Is he going to do the uh, the people's elbow or not? So fun fun wrestling weekend. The Hall of Fame last night. I did my review video of that. Oh, the Rock doing the one thing. He's not raising the thumb to make the loser thing. It's People pointed out now Rock's doing his little rock bottom dance. Goes for the elbow, nails the people's elbow, hooks the leg. One, two, three. Wow. Well, I would hope that Cody's going to win the title tomorrow night because if he just <laughs> took a pin pretty much clean, you know, one, two, three in the middle of the ring from a fucking people's elbow of all fucking things. So I would assume that Cody's going to win the title tomorrow. It could be wrong. Uh, but if he doesn't, he's going to look like a real asshole, to tell you the truth. If Cody ends up getting pinned or beaten twice in one weekend by these guys, they are destroying their number one baby face. I mean, you, you know, I was kind of debating with my pal there, Ian Patrick. Uh, he thinks that Cody might lose this match and, uh, you know, lose tomorrow night, basically. Um. But I don't know. I think it's I think it's a done deal. I think Cody's going to win the title. I'm renouncing my earlier prediction. Uh, if uh, I thought that Cody that Roman Reigns might beat the uh, Bruno San Martino record, but he's not going to. I think Cody will probably win tomorrow night. Who knows? It's possible they don't have a win. Uh. All right, folks, so let's see. Let's talk about this WrestleMania. We, we're seeing the closing moments here. Roman and Rock with a nice bro hug. Uh, Cody Rhodes getting pinned. I mean, I guess you could say that there was some cheating with the belt whip, but they also fought outside the ring a whole bunch. So I just think it's a deal where Cody just got beat clean. So tomorrow night, I mean, I do like this whole setup where tomorrow night it's bloodline rules, and that means... Basically, all the assholes, uh, <laughs> Solo and, you know, the other Uso and Paul Heyman and, you know, Rikishi and uh, the ghost of uh, Enzo can come in. <laughs> Seth Rollins looking dejected. Seth Rollins selling it very well. Cody selling it. It'd be great if somebody threw a turkey, a rubber turkey at Cody again. Uh, but yeah, it's interesting. I mean, this whole leukemia thing with Roman Reigns, I mean, not to harp on it, but they did mention it. So I think it's fair game to discuss. If Roman is really going through some tough times with leukemia, he might just be gutting out this weekend and, and pre preparation to drop the title. <laughs> Looks like a flashback to last year. Cody sitting in the ring uh, with his elbows on his knees, dejected. And uh, Roman and, and with his title and The Rock with his fabricated title, he's, I mean, it's just, why does it, everybody just make up a championship and just, and this is like Herb Abrams UWF where everybody just has a belt that means nothing at this point. It's interesting to see Paul Heyman as the kind of sort of manager uh, to The Rock. And, uh, so, I mean, here we go. Philadelphia, they, they, they were making a big deal of commentators about how cold they all were. Uh, you know, my feeling is drink some cocoa, gentlemen. Uh, it looks like the crowd is okay. I mean, no one's out there with a winter blanket around them. Uh, 
Cody has a sad look on his face, but he has no one to blame but himself. It might be an interesting wrinkle if they had um, Seth take the pin because then, you know, Cody might have a dispute with Seth. But instead, uh, Cody uh, got the pin. <laughs> Cody looking dejected is priceless. I got to give it up to this Cody Rhodes guy. He really does play the baby face uh, pretty well. I mean, he's not as, as big as a Sting or, uh, you know, guys from the past or, or even Cena, I guess. But I think Cody plays like the baby face well because he, he does have these moments of looking uh, dis disgruntled and pathetic. And <laughs> I'm getting a good chuckle out of it. Uh, Jonathan CT, uh, Jonathan Steele, if you want to chime in, please do uh, or, or whatnot. All right, so now we're ending with our end shot of, of Cody and uh, Rock and Roman. So now they're doing the uh, the flashback. So let's go through this, folks. If you're just joining in, this is your buddy Mike Messier. Like a lot of other podcast people, I'm just doing some nice uh, WrestleMania Night 1 thoughts tonight. Let's go through these matches and see what we saw. Uh, blah, 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 blah. I just want just wanna to find the results. It's it's so hard. Uh, first match tonight was Becky Lynch challenging Rhea Ripley for the women's title, and one of the women's title. It gets confusing, doesn't it? When like you have to have double champions for everything. Uh, but I thought it was I thought it was good. Um, I thought that uh, the, the opening match was pretty strong, very strong. I was kind of thinking they might have Becky win. I'm pleasantly surprised, uh, to be honest with you, how good um, Becky Lynch looks, uh, both in the ring and just as a human being after having a, a child. She really looks like she's child-free, and that is a compliment, believe it or not. Um, she, she just looks really like herself, and... Uh, She's wrestling quite well. I remember a few years ago when one of the Bellas, I think uh, Brie Bella had a kid, and then she never really wrestled the same. And I think she stiffed Liv Morgan in a match on Raw at some, some point. Uh, but in any event, Becky Lynch did look really good in defeat. It was a good match. And uh, there you have it. So I thought that was a, a good, strong start. I thought they might have Becky win. Because if they did, they'd have something for Rhea to do. She could just chase uh, her around a little bit. But they didn't. Uh, they went with the uh, hot ticket right, right now, which is Rhea Ripley. Uh, she's grown her hair out. She is very dominant. She's ex uh, excessively popular, especially with the uh, wrestling fans, the simps, so to speak. So that, that was that one. And... Uh, what did we have next? Uh, I think the next match, if I'm not mistaken, was that giant uh, tag team match. Uh, the two sets of titles on the lines, on the ladders. And I'll be honest with you guys, I this was you've heard about the hot dog match where people take a, a break from the watching the wrestling show to get a hot dog. I kind of had a moment like that. I had a, what I would call a, a, a shower break. I was... Uh, very physically active today and I just wanted to clean up a bit to enjoy this night of wrestling. So I took the opportunity. They had so many commercials in that uh, moment before the tag team thing. Uh, so I did not see the whole match, to be honest with you. I did catch the end and I did see the two belt picked up. I thought that was interesting that they had the two belts and welcome to the show. My buddy Gonzo, how you doing, pal? What's up, bro? How you doing? I'm doing really good, buddy. I was just talking about the tag team match. Did you did you catch? Uh, well, let's go back to the first match. Becky, this is my buddy, buddy everybody, Ian Patrick Gagnon. He's been here a couple of times before. Uh, Ian, let me ask you. You were in Florida as well, correct? Yeah. And what did you did you catch the first match of the night? Becky Lynch and uh, our defending champion Rhea Ripley. Did you catch that one? I did. What did you think? I thought it was a really good match. And uh, the them talking about her having like the strep throat, I think they said, and she had like 102 fever and all this other stuff. I was like, okay, I didn't know that. And I was like, well, that's pretty crazy if she's going to go out there and, you know, it's tough to, I, I would imagine it's tough to go out there and do a show like that if you're really sick. 
So, um, but that was a good match. I thought it was really it, honestly, dude. Like anything, uh, either one of them are in is usually pretty good, you know, or really good yeah. or great, you know. Like they're they're two of the best, I think. So, I, I did I like that match. Did you going into it? Did you have a prediction one way or the other of who was going to win between Becky and Rhea? Yeah, I thought Rhea was going to win. I actually thought, um, I mean, sure, you could cover the bases and say I thought Becky might win, but I, I thought if they did have Becky win, I thought it would might be good because then you'd kind of have like something for Rhea to do for a few months, you know, like the the chase to get the title back. Because ultimately, when you get down to it, with with any wrestling, but but it seems with women wrestling especially, a lot of times they don't have in the women's divisions across the board, both AEW, WWE, and a lot of other companies, they don't really have good storylines a lot of time for women unless there's a title involved. And basically, Rhea's whole thing has just been how dominant she's been. If she were to lose to Becky in some type of close match or a cheat, a screw job, or whatever, we'd have, or they'd have something for Rhea to do. And then if she were to get it back at SummerSlam or whatnot, then she's a two-time champion. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But I mean, um, that's a good point. And and you know, uh, thinking about that, it's like I don't really know where she's going to go next now, right? Right. So I'll say we'll I'll say see. this. Yeah, I mean I'll say this, Ian. Um, there is no short of women's talent because when I go to these NXT shows uh, in Florida for WWE. I was one in Gainesville on March 23rd, one in Jacksonville, I think on March 2nd. They have so many women (laughs) in NXT, and some of them are ready. You know, I mean, I've been saying for a while that um, what was the the, the one that was in um, with Mandy Rose a couple of years ago, the three woman thing with Mandy Rose? Oh, Gigi Uh, Dolan, probably. Not the other one. Oh, uh, the other one, uh, fuck, I don't remember her name, but I know you're talking about JCJ. Yeah, that's it. Yep. J- JCJ is beyond ready for the main roster, and I think she's had a couple of matches on Raw. Like, I think they brought her up for a, a match or two, but it doesn't stick. And mm-hmm. I'm telling you, every time she comes out in the, the NXT house shows, she's really, I, I don't, I, I don't think that anybody can be much better as far as just being a professional especially with the wwe system of just the composure solid heel work not doing too much not doing too little instant reaction from the fans she looks good doing everything she does but she doesn't she's a heel and she knows it and she wrestles like an effective heel so um that's someone they could bring up, you know, and and because uh, Rhea would still have the body size advantage over a JCJ, they could do some type of storyline where there's like a psychology element um, to give JCJ the upper hand somehow. Uh, mm-hmm. So I, I would say that although what does Rhea do next is a great question. I think that if they really want to go into and there's a there's a whole bunch of women, I'm telling you, in uh, NXT that could easily challenge Rhea if they want to bring somebody up real quick. And then, of course, you got Jade Cargill. Uh, yeah. Let me ask you, what do you think of Jade so far in WWE before we get to our next match? I thought so far it's been great. And I feel like, so. okay, she's been in the Royal Rumble, and then she had this match tonight. And I feel like just, I mean, what, she's been in a fucking WWE ring for maybe like 20 minutes tops all together now. And everything that she's done to WWE has been leaps and bounds better than what they were doing with her in AEW. She look she looks like the star that she was kind of supposed to be in AEW, but they just couldn't capture that and they just couldn't present her in that way to really bring her up to that level. And it's like seeing her entrance tonight, same thing at the Royal Rumble. Like even at the Royal Rumble, dude, that place popped when she came out. You know what right. I mean? They they were they were into it. So I mean, I, so far so good. I think I, I've I've enjoyed it uh, a lot. What they've done with her, and I mean, I have to imagine that. I mean, what she signed with them probably f- at least four months ago or something. I think she's been training like crazy. So and I think it's she she's shown improvement in the ring. 
So, I mean, somebody like that, I feel like she could be ready real soon to be going in, into a main event picture with the women's division. What do you think about them putting her in a six-woman tag tonight as opposed to some type of other situation, a, a two-on-two tag match or even a singles match? Why do you think they went with the six-woman? I think they went with the six-woman just because they needed to get all those girls a spot on the show. And that was just, okay. you know... That that was just what probably made sense, but um, I I don't know. I don't think it really hurt anybody, you know, because it's not like Bianca Belair has been in the title picture lately, you know. And Jade Cargill's not title picture. Naomi just came back, so I mean, I feel like it was suitable for what what they needed, you know. Yeah, it was. It felt like a showcase match, basically the yeah. showcase. You know the the three ladies that they wanted to showcase naomi returning um she's been back for a little bit of time she came back at the rumble and uh of course jade cargill the new signee and like you said bianca has kind of fallen out of the title picture but she's still a big deal and um you know even cm punk and and uh i want to say Big E said this on the pre-show that having three black women as a tag team was kind of a big deal because i i would probably guess that was the first time in wrestlemania history or even i would definitely say wrestlemania history and yeah. i don't i mean i remember when sasha banks first came in didn't she join naomi and who else did she join in like a three-woman team for a little while Do you remember what i'm talking about it's like when the first when they brought in charlotte becky lynch and um Sasha Banks all in the same night like Stephanie McMahon says this is the women's evolution and she brought the three of them in and basically assigned them to clicks and she put all the she put the three black ladies together which was Naomi uh, Sasha and there was a third lady was um, it Alicia Fox it might have been yeah it no, might have been sure, but Whoever it was, I gotta look that up now because that's gonna. Uh, it was. And it, what was the group called? Uh, I, you know, the more that I'm like, thinking about, the more I'm thinking about it now. I really kind of think it might have been Alicia Fox, dude. I don't. I could might, be totally wrong, but I mean, it was a long it time ago. It, it was like 2018, something like that. Yeah, um, or or even it, before. It was a it was a click, um, it was it was a click that didn't last, and it was just ridiculous because it's like Stephanie McMahon is determining who your friends are, and basically with with Sasha, it's like, well, here's two other black women. I'm going to put you with them. You know what I mean? That's like funny. it was the most <laughs> most low key racist thing ever. Well, <laughs> Sasha, you and these other two black ladies, you could all be together, and I'll put Charlotte with these other and whoever Charlotte was put with was like the athletic girls. And then Becky was kind of put with like the alterna chicks because I think Becky was thrown in with uh, with uh, Paige and uh, somebody else. It was it was really horrible. It was yeah. really bad. <laughs> it very vaguely sounds familiar to me. It, it, like it, it I'm, I'm remembering of, little pieces. It, it, it was given a lot of slack because it's like Stephanie McMahon comes in, basically takes uh, credit for the women's revolution, and uh, basically assigns clicks. Like you're going to be in this click, and you're going to be in this click. <laughs> um, hey, sounds like a McMahon move. Yeah, and this was like at the like the 2016, 2017 when they were really um like really Probably bad. When they had that women's pay-per-view and all that too. Yeah, well well a couple of years before that basically. Oh, okay. okay. Right, I, right, I, right. I did find it. Um no, this I didn't find it. I thought I found it. Yeah, women's Yeah. Oops. I had some. Tr I was trying to find that announcement on Raw whenever it was. Uh, let me uh, let me jump in on this uh, Jade Cargill thing for just a second. Um, mm -hmm. I've heard uh, you just articulated what a lot of people have been saying about Jade in uh, AEW that they didn't use her the right way and they didn't showcase her. I want to ask you, like, 
or just point out first that she was there. Her very first match, I believe, was I was there for it at Daly's Place in Jacksonville. Was her and Shaquille O'Neal defeating Cody Rhodes and um, uh, Red Velvet? Brandy, Brand- oh, Red Velvet. Red Velvet took Brandy's spot because Brandy got oh, yeah, pregnant. Right, right, or something. right. Brandy was either pregnant or injured, so Red Velvet took over the match, and uh, that's why I was doing this because like Red Velvet started doing something with like a soup or something, <laughs> like that became like Red Velvet got a hand single of soup after a while, but um, and uh, the way that I remember it, Jade Cargill pinned Red Velvet. So in a match where you had Shaquille O'Neal and Cody Rhodes and Red Velvet, uh, Jade Cargill got the winning pin. So that was her first match ever, right? She's she's tag teaming with Shaquille O'Neal in her first match. Then they basically created a title for her to win. Um, they created that TBS title for her to win in a tournament. And somewhat surprisingly, she beat Rudy Ruby Soho in the finals of that tournament, which was kind of a big deal because Ruby was someone they were building up. And Ruby had just come from WWE. And then she, um, I don't know, did she hold that title for a year or a little bit more? What's and that, um, around there, yeah, yeah. And and she pretty much was squashing everybody. I mean, there was some some good matches, but she squashed a lot of people along the way. And they made her look incredibly strong. And the, when she finally lost the title, it was on pay per view. She beat Taya Valkyrie pretty quickly, like in six or seven minutes. And then she kind of made an open challenge to anybody, and uh, St- Chris Statlander came yeah. out. And Statlander wasn't really somebody they had built up as a top challenger or anything. I think she had just been injured and was on her way back, and there she was. And I think physically, Statlander was the only one somewhat in the ballpark of Jade Cargill in AEW. And uh, they had Statlander beat Jade for the title, but once again, that was Jade's second match in a row right on the same show and then i didn't see this one but i think they had a rematch on dynamite or rampage where statlander beat jade again but i, I think, think I by that, that yeah i think at that point jade had already decided to leave so i, I guess with all that evidence um I, I mean i would say that they did aew not only gave this lady jade her start you know, and sometimes they would show her daughter in the audience. And even though Jade was like the heel, they'd show that she had a human side because she had a kid. And like this was, you know, she was her kid's hero, if nothing else. And they even gave her a little click. Like they gave her like her own little hurt business. They gave her the, mm-hmm. she had a name for women, like the baddies or the nasty, the baddies. Yeah, the baddies, right? yeah. Right. And it was so Red Velvet. I, Red Velvet was one of them. Yeah, like the chick that she had squashed. Yeah. And she, she did that with the, uh, the other one, the other really super attractive one. I think she beat her, too. I and, think uh, I think the two girls she had was uh, Red Velvet and the Hogan, Kira Hogan, I think. There was a third one. Who's, oh, was there? Yeah, really hot chick. Um, another one that was right up there. Um, so my, my point is, um, I think they did a lot with Jade. I mean, I think they... I think I think I what mean, could be. Go ahead. I I agree with all that, and um, you know, like I I can't. Okay, first of all, I can't say that AEW necessarily did anything like bad with her because obviously, like everything you just laid out is clear evidence of how they were pushing her, and you know, she had the long title reign, she was undefeated, all this other stuff. Um. I think that one of the issues uh, was maybe not enough story, maybe not enough story with her. Cause everything I feel like with her was pretty much, you know, she's going to, she's going to go out there and talk shit to the girl, say how she's going to beat her. And then she beats her. And that's kind of like what it was. So I feel like maybe a little, not enough story hurt her a little bit, but the other thing that I think, and I don't. Did you catch the interview that Jade Cargill just did with uh, Busted Open, like yesterday or the day before? No, did you see any of that? I missed all of it. So, that. okay, she she was talking. Uh, they asked her. Dave Lagreca asked her. Uh, you know, basically, what made her decide to come to WWE? And you know, one of the things that she said was, you know, I'm 31. 
and like time is not on my side. So I don't really have time to be like growing with a company. But I think that, you know, when you look at a WWE show like this, like, like let's take this WrestleMania night one. And then you look at the AEW Wembley show from August. To me, and I mean, a lot of people may agree with this. A lot of people might not agree with this. This might make a lot of people mad. But to me, I feel like AEW clearly looks like the minor leagues next to WWE. And I think that that was a big part of her decision. And she kind of alluded to that in her interview of like, I want to be on the biggest stage there is. And, you know, I want to go somewhere where it's going to, uh, it's the best of everything. And, um, and she even alluded to like some of the training stuff and how basically how it was like night and day, like all the training she's done and all the, you know, coaching and mentoring and all that stuff has been night and day compared to what it was in AEW. So I think at the, at the root of it, that's what it boils down to is just, I can either play for the Yankees or I can play for the, you know, Scranton. Bulldogs or whatever they're called. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, so, and, off and I, workers. Yeah. And, and I think, I think that that's kind of what it boiled down to. And I, and I think some story too, because I think that, you know, at the end of the day, she was going to make her decision no matter what. And I think AEW did do a lot to, I mean, let's put it this way. If AEW didn't book her the way they did, there's a good possibility. She's not in WWE right now. Let me get back to the Jade Cargill debate in a minute. Let's take on some of our uh, friends here. My buddy, Michael A.J. Norris, has two comments, and the ghost of Gonzo has a comment. Uh, so Michael A.J. says, yo, Mikey, good pay-per-view. Sammy was a surprise, and every YouTube predicted Bloodline rules and Cody win night too because Roman beat Hogan and Mania record and 1,001 wins. So, yeah, there was something about Hulk Hogan's – See, Hogan doesn't have a record. Bruno has the record, right? But Hogan on that list of longest reigns, I think Roman tied that tonight or something to that effect or got close. Um, I think he might have beat it tonight. Yeah. So, And I think that he tied Hogan with like WrestleMania main events or something. I thought they said something they like said, that. I think it was like eight. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. But the other thing is that – uh I put this up there on the Foreign Object Facebook group tonight, which people are welcome to join. I, I said it's kind of nuts that Roman Reigns' universal title reign began by defeating Braun Strowman and Bray Wyatt in a three-man match. And uh, Braun was not the champion. Braun had lost the title to Bray Wyatt a week earlier. I think that might have been a week where they had two premium live events back to back during the pandemic era when they had like the TVs in the, in mm -hmm. the venue, actually in Orlando, uh, the Thunderdome. <laughs> oh, it's St. Pete. Yeah. Saint Pete. It, like a major, it's a major arena in Florida where they Trop put all the Tropicana. Yeah. Trop they put all Field. the, well, 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 I think it was an indoor arena because they put all the, the TV sets. Well, I, they, you know what though? They were doing it also from the NXT studio thing. So okay. they were doing it from there, and then they went to St. Pete. By the way, on the uh, – not to have anybody switch off, but they put the three ladies together on the WWE post-show press conference. They got Jade and Bianca and Naomi. So wow. when I was watching that match, it's basically – I'm thinking, okay, this is basically the, the calm before the storm because eventually they're getting to Bianca versus Jade. Like that's the whole point of this. You know what yeah. I mean? And I basically could see that coming a year from now at WrestleMania 41. Um, so let's take, uh, let's see. So, I mean, basically, Mikey, Mikey is, uh, AJ Norris is telling us that most of the people on YouTube kind of predicted so far, so good. Rock and, Rock and Roman win night one. I wasn't thinking that The Rock would score with a people's elbow of all things. I thought no, that I didn't was... either. So if, if Roman Spears, Cody tomorrow night and pins them clean. I think Cody needs to cash in his chips because they're killing their top baby face. If, if Cody loses tomorrow night, especially if he loses clean. Yeah. See, I, I you know, like I, I was, I was talking to you earlier about what I kind of the stuff that I was thinking about it. And I thought if Roman's going to win tomorrow, then Cody and Seth are definitely going to win tonight. And 
I just didn't like, I don't know. I just didn't expect that. I thought, you know, rock or Seth was going to get pinned. I didn't think Cody or Roman would get pinned. And then for the rock, to just go in there and just fucking people's elbow rock bottom. People's elbow is done. I was like, really, really dude. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. It does feel like the rock is kind of having his fun of being <laughs> on the board. And it basically, it, it feels kind of like, um, dad, Dad died in his sleep, and now all the older brothers are taking over the family. So you got Triple H getting all this credit, uh, Paul Heyman swearing up a storm on the Hall of Fame, The Rock giving himself a title for Muhammad Ali. All the all the big brothers of the WWE are now like now that dad's yeah. dad's in the, the the nursing home. Let's have a party and let's let's put ourselves over even more than we already are. Uh, here's a good one from the ghost of Gonzo. I don't know if this is a friend of yours or me. I, I don't know. Dude, you, I saw that. Do you hate me, dude? Do you fucking hate me? What's up? Maybe that's his thing anyway. Maybe he's always <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. just a coincidence. Yeah. I heard Yokozuna is going to be a surprise enforcer tomorrow night. Meltzer <laughs> says he's down 100 or so pounds and moving like his 93 uh, run. That's funny. Um, yeah, that's Yokozuna. Funny. <laughs> I, I can remember watching WrestleMania nine. Uh, and, uh, it's funny because my dad got married the day after WrestleMania nine. So WrestleMania nine was kind of the bachelor party that we're sitting there watching this loss, <laughs> this Caesar's palace, uh, WrestleMania, uh, um, a horrible which, ending too. I, I, it was a horrible ending. I mean, I just kind of laughed it off. I think even by that point in my life, I kind of a little bit emotionally detached from bad booking. Maybe, maybe well, not bro, fully. <laughs> bro, I was six. I was six when yeah. when that happened. So I was a little kid. You know what I mean? So, yeah. and I loved Hulk Hogan. And even then, right. I was like, man, what was that, dude? Like, really? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> uh, Michael had an earlier comment. Yo, uh, we well, we saw that one. Um, and we let's see, Mikey. This fresh start for WWE. This is a fresh start for WWE, and it's heading into the right direction. Drew winning set up him and Gunther, okay, or Damian Priest, and that's another Mister Money in the Bank, Mister yeah. uh, Senior in the Bank. And yeah. I see Chad congratulating Sammy and turning heel on Sammy, winning the championship. Okay, so Michael's uh, AJ is doing some fantasy booking here, and and I like everything he's predicting or he's wanting to see. Um. You know, we, we, I mean, not we, but the WWE freed up Gunther. They took the Intercontinental title off of him, which I feel like that's kind of like an ultimate, ultimate warrior had the title when he did beat Hogan. But I think in other cases, you know, back in the day when the Intercontinental title was really a stepping stone with guys like Savage, like Savage lost the Intercontinental, you know, you know lost the Intercontinental title to Steamboat. And then a year later, he's winning that big tournament. So I can see yeah. where. Um, Gunther losing tonight really does not hurt Gunther. It just kind of frees no. him up. And uh, good for Gunther that he, he lost one, two, three. I guess we'll jump around a little bit. Um, what did you think of that Gunther uh, Sammy storyline and then that match tonight? Uh, I mean, I, th I thought the storyline was, was pretty good. They were kind of, they were kind of doing the Rocky storyline. Sammy's Rocky, you know, um, you know, I thought it was pretty good. I like Sammy a lot. You know, I think he's, you know, just really, really good talent. And like, he's funny. Like I never realized how funny he was until he did the, the jackass match two years ago at WrestleMania. And then he did all that bloodline stuff and it was fucking hilarious, dude. So, I mean, I like him a lot and, uh, you know, it was cool f f to see him have his moment, but honestly, that was, uh, that shocked me more than anything tonight because I was like, dude, there's no way, Fucking! I thought I thought maybe Gable was gonna get involved somehow, maybe turn on Sammy, or I thought maybe Gable was gonna throw in the towel. I heard that somebody said that online, and I was like, "Yeah, that sounds, you know, seeing somebody could throw in. I could see him throwing it. They Gunther just beats the shit out of him. He throws in the towel, and then Gunther was beating the shit out of him. They're like, "Stop the match! Stop the match!" And I'm like, "Oh, Gable's definitely coming out and throwing in that towel." And then when he beat him, I couldn't fucking believe it. You know, but it was cool. He got he had his moment, you know, and I felt like um, they did it in a way that was pretty believable. I thought, 
you know, like, I, I don't know. It just, it didn't feel like forced. It didn't feel like totally far fetched or anything. You know what I mean? So I, I was cool with it. I thought it was, it was the, the biggest shocker for me tonight. The only, uh, I, I liked it and I, I was, I didn't do any of the uh, prediction games, you know, where people do the prediction polls. I, I was trying to find the one of my buddy, Shane McKenna has this cool group wrestling fans on Facebook and he, he always has like the predictions, you know, doc. And I couldn't find it to, to be honest, but um, I would have predicted Sammy because I had a feeling that they didn't put the title on Sammy last February over Roman, which was understandable that they didn't, although I think they could have, you know, because Sammy was white hot back then, like LA oh, Knight yeah. got white hot and, you know, others have gotten white hot that they haven't cashed in on. But I thought Sammy, they could have done more with them. They did give him the tag belts with Kevin Owens, which really felt like a consolation prize. Um, but I thought they did a lot with Sammy. And I think that whoever's, whether it's Triple H or a conglomerate of Triple H and The Rock and Heyman or whoever is making these final booking decisions, I think they kind of said, hey, look, Sammy's a guy that, that has cooled off a bit, but if we gave him a little sizzle and gave the people a reason to be behind this guy, we can kind of build up another top baby face. And, and Sammy's so good, as you said, with the, the humor and the personality that he can – be salvageable as a top guy right and yeah. i think it's so hard and i think even triple h said this years ago like like 10 or more years ago it's really hard to book a top baby face these days because the fans really like cheering for heels and um i think when you get a guy who's who's like that uh in our buddy there uh S sammy callahan who can be a top baby face and really be a baby face without being a heel then you then you do something like this and you give him a rocky story and I I was there for it I enjoyed it. Sammy Callahan. Yeah, Sammy Sammy Callahan. And I'm sorry, Sammy Sammy Zane. Did I say Sammy Callahan? <laughs> yeah, you did. Because yeah, I hate did. Sammy Callahan. <laughs> Sammy Callahan's the one with the baseball bat. On, yeah. Uh, Eddie, 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 yeah. And yeah. he's the one up to uh, the Tessa Blanchard. We got some more comments here. This guy I actually have known probably since some of you guys. Before some of you guys were born, my buddy Alex Clark and I went to high school together. Uh, we watched a lot of wrestling together, including uh, Steamboat beating Flair in February of 89. So probably oh, wow. before some of you guys were alive. Uh, and that was a school night. That was a Monday night. Uh, so basically, Alex, I, last time I checked, Alex was a big University of Nebraska aficionado. And he ended up going there to college. So Alex says AEW lost Jade because they have no developmental. Um, I'm not sure what that that word is supposed to be. Uh, league De because they have well, yeah, AEW totally lost Jade know. because they have no developmental league. So here's this: um, Tony Khan said on a couple of occasions that they're kind of B and C shows, AEW Dark and AEW Dark Elevation, which I think aired only on YouTube. Yeah, and yeah. I went to an AEW Dark taping at Universal Studio in Orlando, and I think in the summer of 2022, and it was painful. <laughs> it was, I mean, I love, I love wrestling. I love seeing live wrestling, but this was about four hours of squash matches. Yeah, no and good. it was tough because I love going to live, and I'll watch a squash match or two. I have no problem, but it got to be very repetitive where somebody kind of a mid Carter there in AEW, like um, who was the, the, the bear country that mid card. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I know them. So they turned heels. They came out with a new manager and had a new name called like the iron shield or the iron Vikings. And, and they came out as heel. They never did that on dynamite with those guys, but it was just a very long process of watching squash match after squash match uh tony khan came out at one point which was nice Britt baker came out and cut a promo but she didn't wrestle so my point is it was just kind of tough like yeah but tony at one point said that aew dark and aew dark elevation were their answer to nxt and there was some groups in florida i think there was even one in jacksonville that were kind of feeder leagues to aew i think powerhouse hobbs kind of came through that and there were other 
wrestlers i can't name them off the top of my head like there's there's those renegade twins like there's a female twin tag team that were the nwa women's tag team champions at one point uh Uh, they beat pretty empowered at the pay-per-view i went to a year ago but a lot of these aw talents did kind of work their way up they would get a trial match on dark or elevation they would broadcast it no matter you know what happened if they got signed or not and then they would get to decide whether or not to sign them there was also a couple of stories where uh people that wrestled on aew dark the wwe would swoop in and sign them <laughs> and i think yeah, the wwe they, they, they did it just to fuck with it with the aew because anybody that seemed to have like a, a cup of coffee worth of potential the WWE figured, hey, if AEW took a lock at them, we'll take them to NXT. And uh, most of them went. So mm-hmm. it's funny how WWE will say they don't have competition. We're head and shoulders above everybody else. Yet they'll do whatever they can to undercut anybody else's progress. You know what I mean? Well, see, it, it, but you know something? The way, the way that I kind of look at it as far as AEW and WWE right now, I basically look at it like a, a cat playing with a mouse like right. wwe is just like playing with a mouse Here, here's my response to that um i think people always pe- people often forget that aew didn't exist until 2019 so this company is still less than five years old i think the first episode of dynamite was uh october of 2019 and yeah. uh, I think that they had a pay-per-view or, or maybe one or two before that. And um, before they actually had a weekly TV show, they were doing a couple of pay-per-views. And then, of course, the all-in, which I guess was the summer of 2018, if I'm remembering correctly. But mm-hmm. my, my overall thought is just I think people – and Tony Khan does it to himself, so he's part of the problem. And some of the wrestlers are part of this problem. But when they kind of – bark at the big dog and and uh, like tony khan does and with the twit with the tweeter just like trump you know tony khan needs to get off x or twitter he needs to take a vacation because if they just went by their own standards this is a company that's less than five years old they have two weekly shows on television uh they have a successful pay-per-view business model old school pay-per-view not streaming but people actually have to pay 50 bucks or if they go to the movie theater like i do 25 bucks to watch an AEW, you know pay-per-view which they used to do four a year now it's up to six or seven and um they have action figures <laughs> they have t-shirts they have ad revenue are they making money or losing money? I kind of think they're making money. I don't have the books in front of me. But if nothing else, and this is not to just say that this is a pity party, but like, you know, good old Adam Copeland Edge said on his promo the other night, they're giving wrestlers a chance to get paid to wrestle. And a lot of groups, um, especially the independent wrestling scene, there's not much money there. And for whatever reason, MLW, um, which is has given us a lot of people that people don't even realize, uh, MJF, you know, Maxwell Jacob Friedman came from MLW, Swerve Strickland came from L- MLW, uh, the Von Erichs were in MLW, the new Von, Von Erich generation, Tony, uh, Tony Schiavone was in MLW, NWA, Billy Corgan holding on to that flame, uh, the remnants of Impact Wrestling or TNA, None of those three groups have come anywhere near the success of AEW. No. So as far as a number two group, I don't even like when Tony says challenger group because, like you said, Gonzo, you know, a, a WWE is kind of head and shoulders above everybody. But I think for for a, a number two group, AEW has done some amazing things in less than five years. I I totally agree with you. I th- I mean, when you look at you know where they're at you know, in five years, I mean, there's, there's no, nobody else has done that. Like if people could, you know, everybody goes back to WCW, you know, in the nineties or whatever, but some people don't remember like WCW was around for six, seven, eight years, nine years before they got hot, you know, and AEW is a startup and it's only been around for five years. Um, 
the thing that drives me nuts about it, though, is that I think right now AEW could be competing with WWE. But I just right. don't – like, it's kind of like I, – I don't know if you caught the CM Punk interview. Um, I did. But it – it's kind of like I I hear what he's saying. It's kind of like what he's saying that it just doesn't seem like it's necessarily about that. Like Tony wants to compete with WWE and he wants to do things his own way, which is nothing wrong with that. Like he doesn't, he wants to be an alternative. He doesn't want to be like WWE, but like for me personally, as a fan, you know, there you, there, you have the people out there that just want to, watch Matt like they just like watching wrestling matches they just like good matches and shit I'm the type of person though like if you don't give me a reason to care if there's not some kind of story behind it or you've done certain things to make me care I'm not going to be interested you know what I mean like watching wrestling matches just isn't going to be enough for me there has to be more to it than that I have to have a reason to care and I feel like AEW has shown flashes of brilliance you know what I mean? Some of the, some of the, some of the feuds that they've done and some of the storylines that they've done have been really good. You know, I feel like all the stuff that CM Punk did when he was there was excellent, and that's with a guy that's like at the tail end of his career that couldn't wrestle the same way that he used to be able to 15 years ago. You know what I right. mean? And, and it was because it was solid storytelling. You know, build up to a crescendo to a match. You finally have the match. You know, like the MJF CM Punk feud was awesome. Even the fucking CM Punk Hangman Page thing was was good, and and that went off the rails and got all fucked up. You know, and even I thought that was good. And I feel like they've done other things too that have been really good. Um, but I feel like you know, there's not they're just not consistent enough, and they have so many guys and so many girls, and like they they don't give me a reason to care about the people that much you know that that's the problem you know i feel like uh they give too much away too i feel like every single show they tell you everything that you're going to see on the show down to like every 10 minutes of the show like every week they put out like that poster of everything that's on the show yo we'll hear from this guy we'll hear from this guy like bro how about you just don't fucking tell me and how about i watch the show and then it's like a surprise i didn't know that guy was going to come out you know what I mean? So I just feel like it's like little things like that, inconsistencies. I don't necessarily believe that Tony Khan, I think he cares about matches. Like, I really do. I think he cares about booking what he thinks is great matches. And I think that there's a certain fan base that likes that. But if if they want to compete with WWE, they have to fucking start doing things different, you know? But but that's not to say that they haven't done incredible things, and that's not to say that where they've gone in five years is incredible. Uh, you know, they, it's but but I don't know if I agree that they're profitable. I don't know about that. I don't know either, and I don't have. I think they're still a private company, so I guess they don't have to yeah, show us. The books. I'll and, say and this: we, we don't have a clue anyway. We don't know. <laughs> you know, right? And and I mean a lot of businesses claim to not be profitable because that's the way to get more money or pay less taxes anyway. So, I mean that's yeah. an old film industry trick. You say that the movie didn't make any money, so you don't have to pay anybody residuals, mm-hmm. uh, especially writers. So anyway, let me. Uh, we had some more good comments here. Uh, did we check this one out? I think we did. Um, because because Michael and and my buddy Alex there actually have kind of a back to back comment about Sammy. Chad congratulating Sammy and turning heel on Sammy wanting the championship. And then Alex kind of hopped in on that too and says uh, Gable turns on him later. So let me ask you, Gonzo, uh, is that a money matchup or is that something that we'd like to see? Is is Chad Gable kind of turning heel like Apollo turning on Rocky? And, and I mean, even Gable said that when Sammy was going in the ring tonight, once again, the Rocky thing. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna need a favor, or I'm gonna ask you a favor once you beat this Gunther guy. So, what do you think? Uh, well, I I guess I missed that. I didn't know he said that to him. He did. Yeah, uh, he, I, I, saw, Rocky. I saw him. I saw Sammy with this kid and his wife, and then I saw him walk up, and Gable came up to him. But I like missed what he said or whatever. But I think what Gable's gonna say is like, "Look, I helped you, and I want a title shot." You know what I mean? And 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 that's probably what it's gonna be. But 
I do think that a feud with them would be good. And, you know, I think that they've already put a little bit into it, you know, as far as just like storyline, because he helped them and they had the training vignettes and this and that. And I think that, uh, you know, they, they can probably do a couple more little things and then do some kind of heel turn with Gable or whatever, and then right. actually have like a, a like a, a pretty compelling feud for a, a pretty compelling match. So, I mean, I'd be all for that. Yeah, what the, what they did was basically it was a Rocky Three reference when Carl Weathers helps Rocky for the second fight with Mr. T's Clubber Lang, and he says, "Once you beat this guy, I want to ask for a favor." And then the favor was Apollo and Rocky had that fight with no audience at the end the, of the movie. Yeah. So now, in the gym. yeah, right. So basically, Chad is saying, "Once you beat Gunther, because Chad almost beat Gunther." So now yeah. Chad wants the match with Sammy, and that's fine. Um, so we'll see. And they, they might stretch that out until SummerSlam or maybe before. There's, there, I mean, they have a premium event about once a month at this point. So yeah. they, they always yeah. – it's interesting how they always have to – you can't just end a story at WrestleMania sometimes. you got to leave it somewhere to go for the next thing. And yeah, that's – <laughs> The, the the crazy thing is all like dude all of these fucking ple's are getting bigger and bigger like the next one after wrestlemania i think is in like paris or something and they have that one in scotland coming up the class yeah. of the castle again like they're starting to put they're starting to have them all over the place they had the puerto rico one last year right. and they're starting to put them in stadiums like they're starting to get stadiums for these things like look at elimination chamber in australia that was a stadium you know what I mean? So it's just crazy because it's like, seems like all the PLEs are starting to have more of a WrestleMania vibe, like bigger and, and you know. They announced one for Germany tonight. Oh, did they? Yeah. When, so. when Gunther was, I think, right, when Gunther was coming to the ring, they showed a bunch of people in Germany watching WrestleMania fans in some type of venue. And then Michael Cole said something about a pay-per-view or a premium live event in Germany coming up in August. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. like, the last week of – the last couple of days of August, like, I think it was August 29th or or something like that. So, I, I guess wonder if that's going to be SummerSlam. I don't think so. I think they had another name no. for it. it, it okay. He didn't say SummerSlam. He said something else. So, and that's the thing. Because they do the thing now with Peacock, and I guess next year it's going to be Netflix – they don't and triple h said that he had an interview tonight a two-part interview started tonight on the pre-show with one of the blonde commentary ladies where it's almost like a relief for the people in wwe the top people that they merged with tko because now some of the pressure of doing the business stuff is off of the wrestling people because when it comes mm -hmm. down to it i would say triple h is more of a wrestling guy than a business yeah. guy right yeah so now that he doesn't have to necessarily worry about all the behind the scenes stuff that they have this parent company of TKO, which I would assume has the best of both worlds, the best WWE people and the best UFC people. Now the wrestling people, i.e. Paul Heyman, Triple H, probably throw Stephanie McMahon in there and whoever else, uh, they can concentrate on wrestling. And, you know, it's, it's kind of funny because it, it just brings me back to uh, I don't know. I think it was after WrestleMania. Yeah, WrestleMania last year when Vince McMahon and Ari Emanuel did the interview when they announced the, the TKO merger with UFC. And I don't know if you remember this, but Ari Emanuel kept using that word flywheel. Like, you know, they can just incorporate right to what we already have a flywheel in place. And he just kept saying it and saying it. And like people were even like, you know, joking about it. I remember listening to Jim Cornette and Brian Last and uh, Brian Last is like, dude, how many fucking times is that guy going to say flywheel, dude? Like, you think they got a flywheel? And uh, but but now seeing how this is going, it's like I go back to that and it's like, OK, it's all clicking for me now because like UFC has been trying to become more and more global. That's been like their focus over the last like eight years. And they're start they've been starting to do events in Mexico, China, fucking Japan, like maybe not Japan, but all these different countries all over the world. They go to Abu Dhabi all the time. They're doing a Saudi Arabia. You know that the Saudi Arabia show that UFC is doing, 
they got the same in because WWE was already in with Saudi Arabia, right? Right. So now you can see that WWE is just going with the same exact model as UFC. Now WWE is starting to go in all these places all over the world and have these shows just like UFC was. And they're also within the States is they're doing the things now where like, UFC is going to be on a Saturday and then Raw will be on a Monday in the same venue. So they're bringing like right. both of the products to the city at the same time. I think that they're, what they're trying to do is do that on a global stage now too, where like, okay, there's going to be like this massive weekend in Australia and Saturday night you have a UFC pay-per-view and Sunday night you have a WWE PLE. I think that that's what they're going for and they just want to expand all over the world. I agree with that. And I would say that one thing that was interesting tonight um, UFC actually had a show tonight, one of their yeah. one of their fight nights, and I would say that that was probably booked before the merger, and because if the UFC WWE TKO thing happened in the last six or seven months, right, and they probably booked that UFC show a year ago or more, so they had to keep that. But I don't think that'll be happening much in the future. I don't think you'll see no very many head to heads because why would you compete no. with yourself basically no and that's why and that's why the ufc thing started at six o'clock those fucking right. fight nights never start at six o'clock unless they're in another country you know so yeah. yeah you know clearly they don't want to run against each other yeah i think like i said that that will probably not be something that they run into again mm-hmm. and they probably were going to have it at 10 o'clock and then they bumped it up to yeah. try to overlap just a little bit and not the whole time. Let's get to some of the other comments here. This this Michael AJ has always got a lot of uh, thoughts on wrestling. Uh, Mikey, Steve Austin and Cena will show with Jay and Rock. Uh, turn on Roman because Roman taking over Bloodline. Will will uh, R- will Rock turn on Roman? He's asking. Uh, he's the elder in the Bloodline. Solo being in Bloodline was Rock's idea because last time they were all together, Rock never been close to Roman and solo was moving towards rock far from Roman. So basically Michael AJ is saying that the rock is going to take over the bloodline. Uh, Roman and Jimmy and Jimmy get involved. Jay fights him off and solo comes out. She Cena shows uh, off. They shows up, they fight off and rock, try to get involved. Steve Austin fights him. Will Tonga, Who's, who's another bloodline guy, but he's not in the WWE right now, uh, show up. No, WWE hasn't mentioned him coming in yet, and Cody will. And I want to see if he uh, he didn't really go beyond that. But basically, more, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mix of speculation and fantasy booking yeah. here. So I think the gist of it is, um, are we looking at The Rock sticking around for more wrestling and The Rock kind of taking over the bloodline? And um, Roman either becoming a baby face or Roman going off TV for a while and then coming back to feud with The Rock. Uh, this has been bantered around pretty much ever since The Rock did that promo three or four months ago about where do I want to sit? Do I want to sit at the booth of the bar or the head of the table? So what do you think? Uh, are we looking at The Rock and Roman fighting over the bloodline? The Rock take it over kind of like he did with the Nation of Domination 25 years ago? What do you think there, uh, Gonzo? Well, I mean, one, obviously, at some point, Roman and Rock's happening. I mean, that's definitely happening. I don't know when, but it's going to happen at some point. Um, but, I mean, dude, honestly, the way that they – what they did tonight kind of just made me question what's going to happen tomorrow even more, you know. Um, but, like I said, I did hear that uh, – I, I mean, I could see The Rock taking over the bloodline. Uh, but then I also like don't know if I really see the rock turn on Roman tomorrow. I guess it could happen, but I don't know. Something about it seems like it would just be too fast, like it would be rushed, and, and there wouldn't really be a good reason, I guess, for that to happen. Um, but I, I did hear that they signed the two two new Samoan guys, the one of the fought uh, another fought two and somebody else. I think I think Jacob fought two is one of them. Who's been okay. uh, pretty pretty well known on the indie scene? I'm pretty sure. Like, I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure they signed him and another guy. And uh, you know, originally I I thought you know Roman was going to win tomorrow, which I'm I'm not so sure about that now. But um, 
I thought that, you know, probably we would see those two new Sinamoan guys and that's kind of how they would get around, you know, or, or have like some kind of swerve. Cause like the thing is, Safe I don't that too. Safe of that too. I, that might be his name. I'm not sure. I just, I don't see uh, tomorrow not having some kind of swerve. Like something's going to happen tomorrow that we don't expect. And that's, and, and the two Samoan guys could be something like that. That could happen. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure, but I think something's going to happen tomorrow that we won't expect. And like I said, I don't really, uh, I don't really know what they're going to do now. I felt pretty confident about it before, but after tonight, after the way all that shit played out, it's like, okay, now I really don't know. But the one thing though, is I heard that the rock is, uh, lined up for a movie from like, I don't know, eight, this month till like July or something like that. So I don't right. think the rock's going to be wrestling for the next couple of months. So I don't know. I don't know. We'll see what happens. One, one thing about WWE, in the, the most recent years, especially is they've been pretty good from their st- standpoint of they can kind of tease a storyline or even start a storyline. One of the people involved goes away for quite some time. And then they just come back later and they pick it up right where they left off. And I think they've done stuff like that with with feuds and they've done stuff. Even you could say with Cody Rhodes, the guy was gone for 10 months and basically they picked up where they left off. Like, he was, yeah, you know, he had the torn peck match with uh, with uh, Seth Rollins in the cage. And then he, you know, had the peck, had to get that fixed. And when he did, they more or less hot shot at him to win the Rumble. And then he gets his shot with uh, Roman. And then he, we know what happened yeah. from there. That was last year's yeah. WrestleMania. So I, I, I feel like Rock could easily tease or start this Cody feud. I mean, I think the money match here is Cody one on one with The Rock, whether there's a title yeah. involved or not. I actually thought this, uh, when, especially when The Rock came out tonight, my headphones just went. Uh, crazy but when the rock came out tonight with that people's championship belt that he got as a gift from muhammad ali's widow i'm thinking is this a a made-up title so that when cody doesn't beat roman cody's gonna face the rock for the people's title is like is that is that gonna be the thing where they just everybody and, and i said earlier before you came on here that it's like the herb abrams uwf from 1990 where every single match has a fucking title belt to it you know what i mean and, um because the only guy without a belt tonight was cody i mean set in the main event seth yeah. had his belt you know roman's got his belt and uh, now Rock has his made-up belt. Uh, let's see. Mikey, Roman taking time off until SummerSlam or Saudi. I mean, here's the, the thing with that. From SummerSlam, Facebook user. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's It still might be Michael AJ because, uh, like I said, if you if you comment on the actual YouTube uh, thing over your on one pro wrestling <laughs> sports fan, then I can see your name. If you comment on Facebook, sometimes it just says Facebook user. Uh, um, so that's okay. But basically – um, Roman taking that much time off, that gives me flashbacks to like 2017 Brock Lesnar, like when he was the champion and he would defend the title twice a year. And I just feel like if Roman somehow, if Roman does walk out with the championship tomorrow night, I hope that they don't just give him the summer off or the spring off because I, gotta I feel get like my, I got to get my charger. I'll be right back. All right, go ahead. That's no, no, no problem. So I just feel like uh, we got a little little shot there of uh, God. So, but uh, I feel like that's a little bit, you know, too much for a champion to take all that time off. And, and not to go back to 1980s wrestling rules, but the 30 day um, clause used to be a thing. You know, that th- that was one of those wrestling official rules that actually seemed to help wrestling when a champion had to defend the title every 30 days let's take another look at this comment from michael aj what killed AEW for me uh the devil mask adam cole just as bad as wcw shock master well part of that uh aj was i don't know if they started that whole devil thing with adam cole in mind and that once they decided to take the we're, we're talking about this AEW thing with the mask and adam cole as the devil I, I didn't really have a problem with Adam Cole being revealed as the devil, but as other people have pointed out, 
if you're going to do that, then do it. And and even if MJF is on the shelf for a while because of real injury or storyline injury or contract negotiation or whatever's going on with MJF, where we haven't seen him since he lost that title to Samoa Joe, why isn't Adam Cole presenting himself with this devil gimmick? Uh, I don't know if you've been following AEW enough to comment on this one, Gonzo, but basically they were doing this whole mystery angle of somebody's wearing a devil. Oh, yeah. I know. I know right. the whole thing. So uh, as far as I know, and I haven't been watching Dynamite religiously, but has Adam Cole done anything with the devil mask or made any allusions to the devil since he revealed himself to be the devil, or have they just kind of put that on the shelf? I don't know. I haven't been watching enough to know that. Yeah, you know? from and, from and what it, I've heard, from what I've seen, the same thing though. I haven't seen any devil mask. <laughs> so yes, so he revealed himself at the pay per view where MJ off lost in his hometown to uh, Samoa Joe, but it seems like they've just kind of buried it, like they just or or just put it on the shelf that MJF was the devil the whole time. I will Man, say I this, though, Adam, buddy. Adam Cole is the devil, though, right? Wait, Adam Cole is the devil, yes. But, but yeah, okay. MJF, he, basically, MJF lost the title to Samoa Joe, I think, because part of it was that Adam Cole couldn't get like the ring in time for MJF to blast Samoa Joe with it. So Samoa Joe was able to put the clutch on him, like the choke out. So mm -hmm. the idea being that Adam Cole... You thought he was trying to help MJF, but just couldn't get the ring in time. But then the reveal is that he wasn't going to get the ring. He was purposely not getting it on time to distract MJF so that Samoa Joe could choke him out and take the title. Mm -hmm. Then when the pay-per-view ended and everyone was so surprised that MJF lost in his hometown to Samoa Joe, I think they did the whole blackout thing. And then these masked henchmen were holding Adam Cole and um, MJF. Then they did another blackout, and suddenly Adam Cole had the devil's mask on, and it's revealed that he's the devil. And it was like, you. oh, sorry, guys. It was a group of like um, Matt Taven, Mike Bennett, uh, Wardlow, who's from MJF's past, obviously, mm -hmm. and Adam Cole. So they had like this this group that I think they did in the old Ring of Honor. And uh, those two of those guys, Mike Bennett and Taven, I'm actually pretty friendly with in real life because I used to do commentary for their matches. And so I was happy to see them. And Wardlow and uh, the other guy from Cole's old group, the the whiny guy, the friendship guy. Roderick Strong. Yeah, Roderick Strong. So it was a five, five of them. So I don't know how much that group is being pushed because basically it was looking like, okay, another um, – another heel faction and um, my buddy Alex is chiming in that both Adam Cole and MJF have bad injuries, which is true, but it's kind of like, is this another storyline that they've pushed here? They're doing an AEW. They're pushing a storyline to the sidelines when MJF and or Adam Cole are back from the sidelines. Can they put this storyline front and center again, or at least in the mix? And uh, Alex, it seems like you've been watching AEW Dynamite more than me and Gonzo. Do you have any information? Has that group continued at all? Like the Mike Bennett, Matt Taven, Wardlow. Let's see if yeah, Alex has any insights because I haven't been watching Dynamite, so I can't give an honest answer. I don't know. I mean, I've I've watched a little bit, not much, but I've watched a, a very little bit. And from what I've seen, uh. Wardlow is by himself, and then the Matt Taven and Mike Bennett guy, I think, are a tag team together. And I, I don't know anything beyond that. So, I mean, the group could still be together. I just haven't seen anything that I've seen. Hasn't been with the group together. I just saw Wardlow by himself a couple of times, and I'm pretty sure I saw the Matt Taven and Mike Bennett guy as a tag team. So, yeah. I don't know. Maybe maybe that guy knows, though. Right. Uh, so let's see. Let's take a look at. Let's get back onto our matches here. So we started with Rhea and Becky. Uh, the next match was the big tag team match. I thought I've got to watch that one again. Like that's on my homework list is to watch the big tag team crazy championship match. It seemed like a match that everybody was having fun with. Uh, 
they had two new tag team champions. I wasn't even sure. Was there champions going into this match, or was the titles yeah. held up? Who were the that champions champ going into? Judgment Day. Okay. So they lost both sets of belts. Yeah. So the, the first one they lost to was uh, A-Town Down Under, right? Well, uh, from what I understood is that the match didn't end until both of the championship belts were pulled down. But then I was like wondering, okay, well, what if two different teams pull them down, which is what happened. So yeah. I don't know if it's like the last team to pull the last belts down win. I think that's what it was no. like. The no, last it wasn't. Team. No? It was a town down under gets one set of belts and uh, awesome truth got the other set. So there's two, two sets of champion now. Correct, because when okay. A Town down we, when A Town down under, which are kind of like the cool heels, I think, when they got the belts for I believe SmackDown, they announced them as the new SmackDown champions. They took oh, like ten okay. seconds, and then they were fighting to get the other set of belts to pull off the sweep, and then they got dejected, and then the match continued for another ten minutes or so. So somebody must have been SmackDown tag champs then, right? I think the I know, titles like, were unified going into this thing. I think both one team had oh. both championships, and they had been merged together for a year at least, and then this uh, was a way to split them up again. To split them up. Okay, got it, got it. And in a sense, that, I mean, I'm not one for having double championships across the board, but in the modern era of WWE where you have all these wrestlers across – SmackDown Raw and NXT and whatever else they're doing, I think it's okay. Although I'm still not a fan of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I mean, I I think it's okay with the tag belts. I, right. I, I don't mind that because I think that it gives more people a chance to be like in the mix for something that, that has meaning. You know what I mean? Right. Um, but I don't like when they like necessarily caught like, you know, copy every belt, you know, for, for each show, that's kind of stupid, but I think the tag belts is okay. Just because you get so many guys a chance. Uh, my buddy, Alex is chiming in. That it was undisputed kingdom. Oh was yeah. The, that's yeah. I th so I think that's what they were called. I'm not sure if that's the AEW name or if that's what they, they, they had that in ring of honor with those guys because it was the undisputed era in NXT back in the glory days for Adam Cole's NXT when he was like the 190 pound NXT dominant guy. Um, so we have a, let's jump on this real quick. We did talk about this a little bit earlier, Mr. Ron Bomb, but here's a new viewer. So I want to check in with him. And then we have a big question coming up. Where do they go with Ripley after this? That's what we were conjecturing earlier. Um, basically you can go back and watch us before when we're done here, but my thought was if they had Rhea Ripley lose tonight, then they have something for her to do, which is basically chase Becky Lynch until SummerSlam or whatever. Uh, but they did not do that. They had Rhea continue to dominate. I did make a point that NXT has at least four or five women that are ready. I said that JCJ, who used to be in that group with Mandy Rose, JCJ is more than ready to go to the top leagues. And she's great. She very captivating, great heel. They could bring her up. Um, so that's, yeah, but the overall problem with women's wrestling in both WWE and AEW, as Gonzo pointed out, and I've pointed out, everyone points this out. Unless it's for a title, they have no storylines for these women. And uh, it's kind of distressing because, yes, the women athletes are great. Uh, the, the women in NXT, the women in, in uh, AEW and WWE, they're all uh, very good very good these days but they don't have storylines for them and um it's it seems like the only storyline for women for the most part is uh championships and i would say that alexa bliss when she was working with bray wyatt and the fiend and uh she was in that documentary and she had some really nice words for uh bray wyatt uh alexa bliss return incoming on monday i haven't heard that i know that she had a baby with her uh her husband and uh congratulations to her i don't know anything about an alexa bliss comeback uh I, I think the baby has been born and uh she's probably been gone for a year and a half or two years what do you know about alexa bliss uh gonzo nothing 
I don't know. I, yeah. I, I didn't even know she had a baby. She did. That's why she's been gone. And um, she, wow, she was born on August 9th, 1991, is uh, Alexa Bliss's birthday. She's wow. five foot fury. Uh, she is a really great entertainer. Oh, um, yeah. And I felt bad that in the Ronda Rousey era of WWE, I think Lexi, her real name, or Alexa Bliss, was like the victim of a lot of ragtagging by Ronda. Like Ronda's kind of learning on the job how to wrestle, and she's using Beat Alexa Bliss. Human, yeah, using using the five foot Alexa Bliss as a human punching bag. Yeah. So Alexa is pictured here at Disney World on her Instagram Instagram with her baby. Uh, kind of smartly, she's she's blocked out her baby's face and all these pictures. She does have this husband who kind of looks like an accessory, like the husband looks like the personification of a of a nice purse that a young woman like Alexa Bliss would want to carry, like buy in the mall, and now she's got the husband. I don't know when she's coming back. I mean, the guy's name is Ryan Cabrera. Good for good for him. Good for her, I guess. She does have a lot of these preggy photos. Uh, she has a photo of her in the fiend outfit. Um, she seems like a really nice lady, and that she is a mom now, so uh, good for them. I don't know if she's coming back, but I did have a prediction for this weekend, and I guess I only have one more night to see this come true. If you watch that Bray Wyatt Peacock special, I it's didn't. very – Yeah, I want to. I, watched it. I, I want yeah, to. It's two hours. It's definitely worth watching. Watch that, and at the end of it, I mean, this is a little bit of a spoiler, but not too much. At the end of that thing, they they roll the end credits, and if you skip, if you stick with the end credits and don't go on to your next show on Peacock, basically the end credits end, and then you see a, a close-up of a lantern, like the Bray Wyatt lantern, and it kind of flickers, and then they show, like, the visage of Uncle Howdy. I, I heard that, actually. I think I might have saw that, even. Right, that one one so, little clip. Yeah, so Uncle Howdy, as we know, was being played by. I just want to call him Bo Dallas. They've actually that's, stopped that's... using. Yeah, they've they've stopped using the Bo Dallas name. Now they're using his shoot name, which I cannot can't yeah. remember. But Taylor. basically, Taylor, yeah, Taylor Window, uh, Taylor Rotundo, yeah, is uh, basically being positioned, from all <laughs> accounts that I'm looking at, to come back. As Uncle Howdy, and maybe a, a re-manifestation of this, of, of Bray Wyatt's vision for wrestling. And I would also predict, if you notice tonight, they showed um, Braun Strowman kind of doing the Big Shot, the Big Show thing, where Big Show hosted WrestleMania from the world in New York City, the nightclub one year, because Big, Big Shot, Big Show wasn't being used for WrestleMania, so they made him host at the, the WWE nightclub in New York City. That's like 20 years mm -hmm. ago. But my point is, mm -hmm. Ron Stoneman was doing that gig tonight where he was like playing a bartender in some bar and serving up oh, that, really? that, that weedy whiskey that they're pitching, right? So yeah. I see where they could do uh, Bo Dallas as Uncle Howdy. Uh, Braun Strowman, they could make, if he fits into that Fiend suit that they've got, the jacked up Fiend suit, or maybe a new character. If Alexa Bliss does come back, you know, even if she's a mouthpiece for the group, that would be fine. And I think you could also draft in some other wrestlers, <clears throat> especially from the uh, you could bring in you could bring back Eric Rowan if you wanted to. Yeah, yeah. Or you could just bring in some new guys because, like I keep saying, at these NXT shows, there are so many wrestlers that are capable of moving up. Some of them may not be the best speakers, but any number of them would be more than fine for like a big guy in a in a bray wyatt type costume thing mm -hmm. yeah i mean uh so so to go with your so your your prediction was that uncle howdy was going to be at wrestlemania that there will be a re-emergence of the whole bray wyatt vision oh, either, oh you think the whole okay okay I, I think they're bringing it back and i think it's it's a tribute. It's it's a way to get Bo Dallas back in the mix. I guess he was in the mix because he was doing Uncle Howdy. Uh, that was him. I mean, they, they basically certified that. And the only reason why Bo Dallas stopped wrestling is because his brother died. So, you know, he didn't do anything wrong, per se. He didn't piss anybody off. Or, you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. it seems like Bo Dallas is in the good graces. 
this family. They put Barry Windham and Mike Rotundo in the Hall of Fame last night. Um, and basically, it seems to me like they have enough of Bray Wyatt's drawings and paintings and ideas and enough people were close to him. He, he's got his ex-wife. He's got Jojo, his fiance. <clears throat> he's got some good friends, like the guy that designs all the costume. It seems like enough people in the Bray Wyatt inner circle kind of knew what Bray was up to with his creativity. And it seems like Bray left behind enough sketches and and. I don't want to speak for him, but it seems like people knew what he wanted to do. You know what I mean? So yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. With that said, if they're going to continue to give this family, because I kind of feel like this Rotundo Wyndham family is kind of in that same mix as the Samoan family oh, and yeah. uh, and other WWE family, the Rhodes family, I guess you'd say, yeah, where yeah, like yeah, it's kind of like the old mafia. Like there's these certain families, right? Yep. Yep. And the, the Wyndham Rotundo family has kind of made themselves through the generations with Black Jack Mulligan and Barry Wyndham and Mike Rotundo, and now with Bray Wyatt, especially. It seems like one of the, this is one of those families that's going to be taken care of. Yeah. And in order for them to kind of earn being taken care of, meaning the money, just like Warrior, you know, whether Warrior's widow was any good for wrestling or not, they gave her a job on the WWE creative team, right? Uh -huh. but I feel like Bo Dallas is going to get that paycheck from WWE because not, but not only that it's, it's worth something like Bray Wyatt's creativity, even with Bray himself gone is worth money. I mean, because he had some great ideas. So yeah. the, these characters are, in my opinion, are going to be rebooted like the, the rambling rabbit and the puppets and, and, and then I think some new characters that are either things that Bray had sketched out before his passing or, you know, Bo Dallas was close enough to him. If Bo has a brain in his head, which I think he does, you know, and I don't know if he's as advanced or as dark or, or whatever as his older brother was, but I would think that he's somewhat in that ballpark. I think they're going to continue the Bray Wyatt vision for gothic horror, you know, absurdist wrestling. Um, which I thought was good. And I think I, that, I, yeah. you know, so I, I'm looking forward to it. If it, if it, if it, if it happens, it's either going to be tomorrow night, obviously, because it didn't happen tonight. And then the other option is Monday night raw, which might even be better because yeah. The, yeah. You know, That's WrestleMania they, they always have surprises. So like the raw after WrestleMania always at least one or two surprises. Right. And I think that with WrestleMania, with the Cody and the Rock and Seth, and, and tomorrow night you get the extra wrinkle of Drew McIntyre, who I think needs to get a belt. So oh, I'm yeah. kind of assuming that Drew's going to get a belt as well. And yep. um, what else is happening tomorrow? You got a bunch of stuff. I mean, you got Bailey. It, I, I, I'll I say tomorrow I think it's going to be way uh, – I don't want to say – I think tomorrow's going to be better than tonight was. They, there's a lot, a lot of – like a lot more that I'm looking forward to tomorrow as opposed to tonight. You know, I, I mean, obviously I was looking forward to the main event tonight. I wanted to see the Sammy Zane Gunther match, but like tomorrow LA night, AJ styles. I want to see that. I think that's, they, they've done a good job with that. The uh, final Testament against Bobby Lashley and street profits. I want to see that, um, you know, and then they have, you know, the, the Bailey match, Seth, Seth I mean, Drew McIntyre has been doing like the maybe the best work of anybody lately. Like his promos are fucking on point, dude. The vignettes they're doing with him, his attitude, everything. He's just been totally on point. And they're doing the match in in his in Scotland. The I think the Castle Two yeah. or whatever is in. So they gotta they he's gotta be a champion or fighting for a title at that. And um. You know, so I, I think that Drew will win that title tomorrow night, if not soon after, from Seth. Well, I mean, Seth took such a beating tonight. It's like, how could anybody really expect the guy to win, you know, tomorrow? And that's kind of protects him, I think. You know, he took such a beating tonight that if he loses tomorrow, I mean, is it really on him? He got his ass beat tonight. You know, The Rock was cheating left and right, you know, so. Right. And it's, it's also interesting because, I mean, 
I think part of Vince McMahon's thinking going back to WrestleMania 19 when they didn't have Booker T beat Triple H and they did have Kurt Angle beat actually they had Brock Lesnar beat Kurt Angle and the thinking that Vince has the, the idea was Vince didn't want two title changes in one night he wanted you know Brock to be the only new champion now a year later for whatever reason he changed his mind because Cena uh, won a title over JBL, the SmackDown title, and then Triple H lost the Raw title to Batista. <clears throat> so Vince's, you know, ethics or his strategies or his booking policies seem to change on a whim. But the point is, even if Cody were to win tomorrow night over Roman, I still think that having Drew beat Seth makes sense because yeah. you have one heel champion and and Drew, and you have one babyface champion in Cody. 100%. Yeah. Uh, let's take a look at this comment. This is kind of a big one. Uh, Mikey, do you, if you see Pat McAfee when The Rock was on, he spoiled it. He spoiled WrestleMania 40. This was when Vince was back during TKO's merger. Rock and Roman was a lock for WrestleMania 39, but Rock didn't do it because he changed Cody and Roman. Roman was one because TKO was taking over. WWE, nothing could have changed until this year. Vince is gone. Hunter full in charge and wants something new and fresh and exciting. Cody being Roman uh, will happen, erasing Vince from WWE and stuff. Roman being heel and championship reign was his last idea and couldn't touch it yet. This uh, comment plays well with the with my running predictions several months ago i made a video where i predicted that roman reigns was in fact going to beat bruno san martino's seven and a half year record and at the time i really did believe that uh gonzo and everybody because i thought that they were setting up roman because they don't want people 20 or 30 years from now to have to think about bruno san martino in the 1960s and 70s they want the six-year-old kid in 2024 to grow up and think about roman reigns like when I was a kid, this guy Roman Reigns had all the title, you know, had the title forever. You know what I mean? So they uh -huh. basically want to reboot history a little bit and take some of these old guys, like the Honky Tonk Man with the Intercontinental Title, or Demolition with the Tag Team Title, Longest Reigns. They want to scrape those guys and put in the New Day and put in Gunther, and in this case, put in um, Roman Reigns over Bruno. I do feel like Mikey just pointed out, or Michael AJ Norris just pointed out that. Things have changed, pal, because with uh, with Vince gone, I think that kind of got shoved aside. And I would even say there was probably The Rock himself said, look, I don't want to wrestle Roman Reigns in this match and get booed out of the building. If the people actually do want Cody to win it, let's put the title on Cody. And I think Roman Reigns is smart enough where he's not going to hold him to a deal that doesn't make sense for business. And if it's true, which I don't know if it is or not, that Roman Reigns is struggling with leukemia as we speak, as they said on the telecast tonight, I think that's a good option for Roman to take some time off. And who knows? Maybe that's why Roman doesn't wrestle a full schedule because he does have the leukemia. So maybe that's been an issue for him. I think it plays into it. I mean, uh, do you remember that? Uh, probably like six years ago when he cut that promo on raw, he had yeah. won the belt and then he said the leukemia came back and everything. So, yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think that that's gotta be why he only works part-time schedule, but you know, I, I hear what you're saying about them kind of rebooting stuff, you know? So, I, I mean, I wonder it. See, the thing is though, is how could you ever have somebody in 2020s be a champion for eight years? You know what I mean? It just seems like would that even work today? You know what I mean? I it's I don't even know how it worked in the seventies. Like, how did you have a guy a champion seven and a half fucking years, and that worked? Yeah, I, you know, it, it it was a different time. But I mean, yeah. even now, I mean, I like I made that point out that Roman got the belt over Braun Strowman, and the defending champion in that match was Bray Wyatt, who now mm -hmm. we're doing tributes to because he's been deceased for a, a while, right? So. Mm -hmm. it, Time is really interesting. Um, and the, when when Roman did win it, we were in the middle of a pandemic and didn't know when we were coming out of it. And here we are yeah. now with 78,000. I mean, they put 78,000 people in there tonight. So, you know, people weren't protesting. You know, they were buying tickets. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Let's get on to some of these other matches. The the Bianca Jade Cargill Naomi versus Asuka Kerry Zane and Dakota Kai. Uh, like I said before, I think this was basically an exhibition or a, a showcase match is probably the best way to put it. And I think it basically shows how good Kerry uh, Kari Zane and the other ladies are at selling for these women. And I think that we're basically looking at Bianca Blair versus Jade at WrestleMania next year or some big show like that. What do you think of this uh, six woman tag? Uh, I basically same same way you felt about it. it. Just seemed like a it's basically a showcase, you know, and uh, just a way to get all these girls on the show. And yeah, I mean, I think uh, it definitely see. I, I could see either Jade. I think Jade and uh, Bianca Belli are probably next year at WrestleMania or something like you said, but I could also see them ended up being a tag team and become a tag team champions or something. I could see that too. I'm trying to remember who the women's tag team champions are right now. Uh, I, I, I have not a clue. Even... <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if that title's being defended at WrestleMania. I know that they, they had that merged with the NXT women's tag team title. Well, you know, I think it's Oscar. I think it's Oscar and uh, Kari Sane as tag team champions. Yeah, I think you're right. So they were thrown into this six woman tag yeah. and, and so forth. Uh, so then we got another tag team match, which didn't register too much with me. Sort of a rematch from last year because on one side you get Rey Mysterio teaming up with Andrade versus Santo Escobar and Dominic Mysterio. Dominic is really an interesting case because. He has become like one of the top heels in professional wrestling um, in an interesting way. His dynamic with, you know, mommy, with uh, Rhea Ripley is very interesting. It seems when Rhea's on her own, she's a total fan favorite, but they love Boo and Dominic. What do you, what do you think of all this stuff? I mean, I don't know. It, it's, it's, it's crazy because like, Rhea Ripley is like a fan favorite and it's like, okay, she's got to be a baby face by now, basically. But Dominic, like the people hate him. So yeah, like you said, it's a weird dynamic when she's with him. It's kind of like they hate him, but they kind of love her and they don't really know what to do. And then, you know, if, if she's by herself, they love her. They hate Dominic by himself. Um, I mean, I don't know. I, I think they need to kind of shit or shit or get off the pot with judgment day. So either, you know, figure out what the fuck you're doing with them and and just go to go with it and do it, or you got to split them up. You know what I mean? Because, I mean, dude, they've been together for so long at this point, and it seems it, like it's kind of convoluted now and shit, you know? It, it is a weird faction. I mean, they were started by Edge, right? And he's not yeah, even yeah. – he's, he's with the other company. Um, and, and also, like you said, I mean, Damian Priest with this suitcase – no one's even talking about him for the most part in this whole Cody Rhodes, Roman Reigns deal. But in theory, you know, he could come out tomorrow night and say, hey, I want to wrestle both of your asses. Or he could wait for Cody or Roman to win the match and then bonk him over the head with the, the money in the bank Bro. suitcase. Bro, could you imagine if Cody fucking wins tomorrow? And it's like, oh, my God, he finished the story and fucking Damian Priest comes out and cashes in and pins him. Right. Dude, the people would fucking lose it. They would lose it. <laughs> it is Philadelphia. It would, it would, which, yeah, it would. It would be. It would be a replay of WrestleMania 31, when it was Roman versus The Rock, and Seth Rollins came out and cashed in and won the belt. It would be like the same shit. Yeah, yeah. I, I got to comment on this real quick. I did not watch the NXT pay per view. I think that was this afternoon. Uh, it, maybe I'll go back and watch it. It was good. Dragon off is good. I'm weird, man. I go to the NXT house shows quite a bit, but I don't watch NXT on TV. So I, I, it's just a weird thing. Um, let's see here. Uh, Laria lost to Roxanne. Guess new heels can't lose it. Rule in WWE. Yeah. We got a little tour here. We got a little tour. Sorry about that. That's all right. We got a little tour of the Gonzo world. Hey, I'll be right the, back. I'm glad you're wearing pants, by the way. That's good, at least. Let's see. Trick, Trick Williams and Carmelo. I want to I have the I'm muted Gonzo until he comes back. 
Trick Williams and Carmelo's future in WWE, they're good talents. Trick like Booker T to me and Carmelo like MVP is heel. Uh, I've seen all these guys at the NXT house shows, uh, uh, Michael, but I, I can't really comment too much on what you're saying here because I don't watch the NXT regularly. But I can tell you that the whoop that trick gets a lot of uh, chance at the NXT house shows. Uh, let's take a look at some other matches. The Jimmy and Jey Uso match felt a little underwhelming to me. I didn't think it was that good. I, I had to uh, mute you for just a second there, buddy. I, That's I fine. Heard some, I heard some uh, Roddy Piper bagpipes going on. Yeah, it's, uh, my, it's my TV. I'm turning that down. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> Yeah, just, just kill kill the volume on the TV if you don't mind. Yeah, just, just mute it up. Thanks, pal. So uh, yeah. we're talking about some of these NXT guys, Trick Williams and Carmelo. I really don't have much to contribute to the NXT conversation except to say at the house shows, you see like all these kids and their, their parents chanting, whoop that trick, which is kind of an interesting thing because that comes from the movie uh, – Hustle and flow, Hustle and flow. Yeah. right? Where whoop that trick is about beating a prostitute. So, yeah, I I, yeah. I go to these NXT shows in Florida, and families with their five and six year old kids are standing on their feet, chanting in unison, "Whoop that trick!" And I'm like, do, do they know what they're saying or not? You know, um, the Jimmy and Jey Uso match, I, it wasn't as good as I thought it would be. And I would just say that it wasn't particularly good. I think it it kind of picked up towards the end, but I felt like, you know, no one's lived up to this Owen and Bret Hart brother versus brother match. I thought the Hardys never really wrestled each other very well. I think the Steiners always avoided wrestling each other whenever they could. And I'm trying to think of any, I mean, I don't think the Dudleys ever wrestled each other, but, uh, well, they did actually before they were a tag team. Bubba Ray and Devon did fight. Um, <laughs> but what did you think of this brother thing tonight, Jimmy versus Jay? Uh, I mean, I, I think you kind of said it well. Like, it was not that great, and then it picked up a little bit. And then, it, if I mean, it felt a little underwhelming. I feel like um, Alex is a big fan of Will Ospreay. So Alex is really doing the whole uh, AEW thing here, which is nice to see. Um, I felt like it was underwhelming, and I felt Jay Uso, main event Jay Uso, is he really a main event guy if he's wrestling on the third match of the show? And I just feel like I kind of think with the Usos, that's one of those situations where they're better as a tag team than they are as solos. Uh, no pun intended. I just feel like I don't feel that either Uso is so good that they're better off as a solo guy than a tag team guy. And I think that when they had the angle where either one of them is wrestling Roman Reigns, that means something. But when it's just Jay Uso wrestling as a baby face on his own, it doesn't do much for me. What do you think about that? I agree, um, you know, and it and it's it's it sucks because I felt like the video package that they did before that match was like really good, like right. really good. They had they had footage of them when they were kids and all this other stuff. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Was, I mean, when they're not involved with Roman, it, it seems like it's like less than, and um, they they haven't really been putting anything that's been that compelling you know I, I thought when when jay uso went against roman reigns at uh SummerSlam, that was great you know and, but other than that they just yeah it hasn't if, if roman hasn't been involved it, it hasn't been that compelling with them and and i hate to be the that guy but i mean once again if you take a look at the rock at 50 years old he is physically in better shape and bigger and has more of a presence than any of these guys, the Usos or Cody or Seth, and I, I dare say even Roman. I mean, The Rock just looks like kind of a man among boys in some extent. I mean, I, you know what I mean? And I, I go back to that King Kong Bundy quote where he says, I take bigger, bigger shits than Chris Jericho. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, I guess it's old school, uh, toxic wrestling fan thinking, but 
you know, the guy that looks like he should win the fight, I think should win the fight. And uh, let's see. We'll, we'll wrap this up pretty soon. But we had uh, Gunther was versus Sammy we discussed. Um, Rhea and Becky opened the thing. And um, then we had our, our main event there, the Rock and Roman versus Cody and Seth. And, you know, I, I thought um, – like I said earlier, that night one from, I think it was two years ago, that ended with the surprise of Kevin Owens uh, versus Steve Austin. Yeah. I think that set the bar pretty damn high for a night one of a two-night WrestleMania. And I that was, agree. yeah. And people were loving that. And people were satisfied after that night one. And it was like, oh, my God, we still have a second night of this thing, right? So... I think it's going to be tough for uh, any WrestleMania to really match that part of excellence. I thought tonight was good. I, I, I think if if I were to rate it on a five star as far as the entire card, I'd probably give it three and a half out of five as far as an evening of, of WWE. What did you think, Gonzo? I, w- I would say the same, probably, probably 3.5. You know, so, I mean, some of it like, you know, some of it felt a little bit like filler. Some of like some of it wasn't, you know, the the brother versus brother was eh, it was okay, but Sa- Sammy Zayn and Gunther was really good. Uh, the main event was good, and I thought that uh, the the tag match with Dominic, Dominic and Santos Escobar and against Ray and uh, Andrade, I felt like the character work of those guys is really good. Like that Santos Ex- Escobar guy is good. He, he he plays the role very well. Dominic plays the role very well. Andrade plays the role very well. So I think that they're going to do some really good stuff with all those guys because I think they're just really good character guys. It, it is interesting also to see the, the reverg, re, re-emergence of the LWO, the Latino World Order, mm-hmm. which was basically something that was a – kind of a, a parody of the NWO back in WCW and really some talented people in the modern day LWO. And it's just, it's just amazing to me, Gonzo, like, you know, back when I was watching wrestling in the eighties, there was nobody pushing for the fabulous kangaroos to have a new incarnation. You know what I mean? Um, but it's I like, I don't know who those guys are. I don't, I don't <laughs> even know who that is. The fabulous kangaroos were like a tag team in the 1960s. Of, of guys like Roy Hefferin and Al Costello that had oh, like, they wore like little hats. And I think they were supposed to be from Australia. My buddy Laza would probably, there's probably statues of them in Australia. Um, <laughs> this is Michael AJ again. Roman can't win twice. It will kill WWE and they will not have many fans left. And Roman matches fans will either fall asleep or leave before it or change the channel off. And Cody loses. He gets booed like Cena. So, Basically, AJ is kind of reiterating what I've been saying, which is if they really have Roman Reigns beat Cody Rhodes tomorrow, they're basically taking their number one baby face and throwing him on the sacrificial fire. And they might think that if they have something like CM Punk interfere and have Cody lose, which I was thinking for a while, or if they have um, an Uso interfere or Solo or whatever the they're thinking Samoan guys right the new samoan guys the safe of fatu whoever it might be the rock i mean if the rock comes in and causes you know cody to lose sure that would make sense storyline wise but i think anything less than cody walking out of there with that title and fucking finishing the dream and finishing the story i think it's a big mistake at this point i think in in this instance it is a brian daniel situation or a daniel bryan situation i think you got to put the belt on cody or it's too much it's too convoluted sometimes you just got to do the simple easy thing now, what do you think of all that i think that okay first i'm gonna say for the last month two months three months i've been saying roman reigns is gonna win Right. But I don't see how you can have Cody get fucked up like that by the rock tonight and get pinned clean like that in the middle of the ring and then not have him win the belt tomorrow. 
Like, I don't see how you make that work. Now, my whole thing was I thought that Seth and Cody were going to win tonight, and it was going to be like, finally, he gets the fair fight with Roman. But then Roman still figures out a way to fucking win the belt, cheat somehow, and win. That's what I, that was my thing from the beginning. That's how I thought it was going to play out. But now, seeing that he took that pin like that, I don't see how you make it. Yeah, you kind of have to put the belt on him now, I feel like, if you don't want to kill him. Or, or like, if if he's going to lose tomorrow somehow, it has to be, like, a, a crazy, swerve, mind-blowing type of thing. Like, I wanted to ask you this. Um, what do you think it means for AEW if, hypothetically, MJF showed up there tomorrow night? Ooh. Well, what does it mean for AEW? I don't think it means the end of the world. In some regard, it's a push for AEW because they're basically, unless they have MJF come in and shove him down in NXT and pretend like he never did anything in AEW, I think in a sense it's good for AEW because MJF left the title behind clean. He lost to Samoa Joe clean. Samoa Joe is very respectable as a champion. I think there's enough time passed since we last saw MJF and AEW where storyline wise on. And I feel like kind of like when Ric Flair came over to WWF back in 91, it kind of gave a little boost to the NWA in a weird way. Cause it's like, Hey, this Ric Flair guy, where'd he come from for the people that don't know, you know, there's obviously a big bunch of people that know. Um, so if, if, if uh, MJF comes in, like Flair came in, wins the Royal Rumble, it kind of gives a little bit of credibility to the guys that Flair used to wrestle in the NWA. So I think if M MJF comes in, if they treat him like a star, uh, then he's fine. So Alex is saying, he kind of confused me because first Alex said he was signed months ago. So I thought, wait a minute, did MJF sign with WWE months ago? And then Alex clarified by saying to AEW, which I remember hearing that, that MGF signed a new contract with AEW. Uh, Seth hates Roman more than Cody after bus incident changes Seth turning on. Let me get back to that, but let's stay with this MGF thing for a minute. In the fantasy world, I mean, Alex is saying that MGF has signed with AEW, but in the case that that contract has been voided or, or something happened or there was misinformation, on the off chance that MGF is going to WWE and shows up tomorrow night, I don't think it really hurts AEW. And in fact, um, tonight, I was wondering, um, I wouldn't be totally shocked if Kenny Omega and Tony Khan came out to ringside and sat in the front row. And <laughs> one, if if one of these things of Hulk, uh, Triple, I was about to say Hulk Hogan, but if Triple H comes out and says, we're going to blow the roof off this thing, and they're trying to put 80,000 people in different countries, and whether or not they want to admit it, AEW does have a following. Wouldn't it pop a, pop a rating if they were to bring in a top guy like Kenny Omega for a match against Seth Rollins or Brian Danielson suddenly at ringside and they do a Brian Danielson uh, match with Cody Rhodes or whatever, or they have the, uh, who, who, the acclaimed is in is in the audience and then the claim the new day work an angle my point is that if they really want to blow the roof off this thing and they really want to do some shit that's unexpected then why not embrace the supposed competition why not see AEW as a friendly collaborator when necessary or when wanted to because without vince being the capitalist that he was why not I mean, I hear that. Um, I kind of feel like it's not going to happen because I think Tony Khan fired the first shot type of thing. And I think that, you know, WWE is like, okay, you want to you wanna talk shit or you want to, you know, do whatever. Okay, we can play that game too. And, you know, you saw um, at the Royal Rumble the uh, – the TNA women's champion was there. So I think WWE is going to do stuff like that, but I think they're going to do it with everybody else besides AEW. They'll do it with TNA. They might do it with NWA possibly. 
They might do it with somebody else. I don't know if I see him doing anything with AEW because Tony Khan has said so many things. And Tony Khan definitely fired the first shot. You know, he, he definitely what, was the one that, you know, started talking shit first. What 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 was the first shot? What was the was there an exact first shot you're talking about? Uh I I don't know. I can't say ex- I mean, it would be hard for me to remember off my head, but uh some examples would be um I remember they were doing something. This was probably like three years ago, three and a half years ago. They were doing something with New Japan. And Nick Khan, I think, had also contacted New Japan. And then, or for something, I'm not sure exactly what happened exactly. But uh, then on Dynamite, um, Tony Khan cut a promo with Tony Schiavone. And was saying, like, there's only room for one con in the wrestling business and all this other stuff. And I know that that was, like, towards the beginning. So that, I would say, would be one of the things that they said. Um, And then, you know, also uh, probably about, I don't know, like a year and a half ago or something like that, WWE ran some kind of show. I don't know if it was the same night or something. And then Tony Khan was at the post uh the post scrum or whatever was saying like you know i have money you know they they basically don't know who they're fucking with i'm not like wcw i have money so i just think it's a a whole bunch of little things like that you know that it's like okay cool we can we can play that i i would say that in tony's defense just taking the devil's advocate he was doing stuff like letting Chris Jericho go on the Stone Cold Steve Austin pod, uh, show on the network, right? And yep. there was some other instances, I believe. Billy Gunn. Billy Gunn at the Hall of Fame. Right. And, yeah, so there was a few things like that where Tony and, – and and I think I think Tony gave Jim Ross permission to go to a Hall of Fame or some event, and Jim Ross actually said, no, I, I don't want to do that. I want to show my loyalty to the new company. And – um but my point is, I think Tony was kind of letting guys do stuff with WWE. And then when he asked for something in return, whether it was like video footage of a, of a new wrestler or, or something like that, WWE wasn't returning the favor. And I think what happened, I could be wrong. I think AEW had a pay-per-view on a night and NXT ended up doing like a three-hour free special or something like that. And it might have been like the AEW pay-per-view was at night and the WWE had like an international pay-per-view or a premium live event during the day. So in theory, you could watch both if you wanted to, but it might have been too much wrestling for the average fan to watch in one day, like a three-hour. It was something like a three-hour WWE premium live event from another country at 12 noon or 1 o'clock, and then three hours break, and then the AEW legitimate pay-per-view we actually had to pay alex says i got this uh so i think tony in the scrum after it was really pissed off and he said something like i'm tired of this shit i'm t- i've always been hidden you know i've been very cooperative with wwe i've been very uh cooperative and uh they said that they're gonna return the favor and this is how they- well i'm not gonna put up with it T- tony at times does i mean the, the running joke is that he looks like a cokehead i think He's more of a guy that just doesn't sleep enough. And, and it's caffeine too. Ca- yeah, and just caffeine and flying back and forth. And and I and I've said this, and I'm not. I could say that I'm just joking, but I'm actually not. I hope that Tony's getting laid because of all this stuff that he does for these fucking wrestlers. Like I hope that Tony Storm or one of these women are taking sympathy on the guy because I he thought he is, had a girlfriend. Uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe I he does. He but still, I just think that these these wrestlers should do something for this guy because he's really like a giant babysitter for these fucking wrestlers. You know what I mean? And I hope that somebody's fucking him, whether it's a girlfriend or a wrestler or whatever. I mean, somebody's got to be taking some pity on this guy because he's he's spending money that he doesn't have to on these fucking... I mean, to be honest with you, I would say that being an AEW wrestler is like the most cush job for any yeah. wrestler in history because you wrestle about twice a month. 
you get a big paycheck and you barely work. You know what I mean? Probably, you probably get more paychecks than matches that you wrestle. Yeah. And especially during the pandemic time. And I, th I think, uh, and look, some of the wrestlers want to wrestle every night, but I think like some of them kind of got wise to the fact like, Hey, this is the prison where the inmates run the asylum. Uh, Mikey, do you believe Dave Batista hates WWE and regrets being a wrestler, period? Wanted to be an actor and use WWE to get there. So Cena and Rock would be would have been better towards Batista. It's an interesting question. I don't think I, I don't think Dave Batista hates WWE at all. I mean, from what I've seen, he's been very favorable to Triple H. He always puts over Triple H. I don't think Dave Batista grew up a pro wrestling fan. I think he was a big guy with muscles and, and a certain level of charisma. And, you know, he fell into wrestling. And uh, I think once he got into it, he probably got into it, if that makes any sense. Like once he became a wrestler and was getting the paychecks and the fame and the adulation, he learned to love it. Do I think Dave Batista sits, sits around and watches Antonio Inoki versus Jomo Tusaruta in 1984? Probably not. I mean, I don't think if I said, hey, Dave Batista, what'd you think of the Crockett Cup 87? I don't think he's going to know what the hell I'm talking about. I think no. there's a lot of a lot of wrestlers, and you know this, Gonzo, as well. A lot of WWE wrestlers, especially, Love they know back. WWE. And, and that's about it. And and there's tons of WWE wrestlers that go through their system. And and this is the difference. We You can see like a guy like Muhammad Hassan 15 years ago when he was in the WWE as that character. He's an Italian guy, right? He wasn't even a, a, a guy from another country. But when he left WWE, when they got rid of his character because it was an offensive, controversial character, he didn't go to the indie circuit. He went home. Uh, you know, another a, a guy who's doing some stuff on YouTube now, um, Maven. I don't know if you've seen this Gonzo, yeah. but Maven, yeah. And I like Maven, but, but Maven's become a big YouTube guy now, which is fine. And he's mostly getting by by talking about his 2003 2008 career, which is fine. But if Maven really loved pro wrestling, he could have gone to TNA, he could have gone to Impact Wrestling. Um, they would have used them. And I just think there's a lot of WWE people that are WWE people. You know what I mean? 100%. Okay, here's a name that I'm not familiar with. I don't know if, if this is one of the people you were talking about. Oba Femi. He's got a Brock Lesnar physique. Nigerian oh, professional is. wrestler. Oba Femi beats Dijek. Okay, I've seen this guy at uh, the NXT shows. So this guy is a big guy, and he's he's uh, another one of these talents that the WWE could call up at any time. And so that's that's another good thing about the WWE right now is the depth chart is incredible. And I'm telling you, when I go to these NXT house shows, a lot of times they'll do two shows back to back, and they won't have the same talents both nights because they have so many people wrestling that you're not going to see Lexus King, a.k.a. Brian Pillman Jr., at every NXT house show because they they have more wrestlers than they need. And they they uh, it's pretty incredible, the depth, the depth chart, so to speak. Well, um, w one of the things that I thought was interesting, I was, I was watching uh, one of the Kevin Nash podcasts, and he said how he was talking to Triple H. And... You know, they were talking about NXT and everything and, you know, kind of talking about like what you're saying about how they have so many guys that can just come up and everything. And Triple H told him, it's like, it's not even just that, though. He's like, I got a whole team in there running the truck. And if somebody is going to leave Raw, a Kevin Dunn or whatever, they got somebody to come right up. So it's right. like, it's not even just the wrestlers. It's all the production people, too. Yeah. And I mean, that's... And now, especially even when you have the merger with TKO and, and UFC, if in some you know god awful emergency, all the people that do a certain job at WWE, you know, leave or get fired or or whatever, you have a whole bunch of people at UFC that can step in. You know what I mean? 
as far as behind the scenes stuff. And granted, yes, ultimate fighting and mixed martial arts is not the same animal as uh, pro wrestling or sports entertainment, but they're in the same zoo. Let's put it that way. You know what yeah. I mean? They're, they're in the same section of the zoo. They're both in the tiger or the, the uh, big cats cage. Hey man, I think, uh, I think I'm going to wrap this up in just a minute or two, buddy. Um, tomorrow night is another big night. And do you have any thoughts going into tomorrow night for us, uh, Ian? Uh, well, uh, I mean, I will say I'm looking forward to it. You know, like I said, the AJ Styles and uh, LA Knight, I like that one. I like the final testament against Bobby Lashley and Street Profits. Uh, you know, I think Karrion Cross is really good. Um, and I always like the authors of Pain you know, whatever that was seven, eight years ago when they were around. So I, I'm looking forward to that. Um, I I feel like Bailey's going to win and finally have her WrestleMania moment. And, you know, I, I'm looking forward to that for her if that's going to happen. Um, and, you know, the, the title matches, Drew and Seth is, is very compelling now considering uh, Drew's going to be fresh and Seth's going to be all banged up. And, um, you know, like I was saying to you earlier, I think that the main event has, um, you know, so many different variables now. You know, I didn't think it was going to be blood volume rules. You know, I thought that Cody and Seth were going to win. So you got that. But then you also get they're both beat up. So, right. you know, I feel like that just adds so much to it. Uh, so many different layers and, and so many different avenues that you can go now in the match because they're both beat up and everything. So, um it's you know I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be good, and I my don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> my my buddy uh, Alex uh, says if you need a an AEW, I got you. Uh, appreciate that. Like I said, I've known Alex for quite some time, and uh, Alex was actually there with me. I'm remembering the lineup here. I believe Alex was there. Uh, when we went to the 1989 Great American Bash for the Flair Funk, that's how old we are, buddy. <laughs> we were. Alex was in the car and at, at the Baltimore Arena, sitting right next to me when we're watching Brian Pillman, the original, uh, against Wild Bill Irwin in the opening match on the '89 Bash pay per view, and all the way we had a really good view of the two rings because we had like a, a side seat elevated, so we had a perfect view. I've got some pictures from that. We saw the whole Muda sting and and everything else. Um, Is that the first War Games? Nope. That was 89 that we were at. It did have a War Games, but it wasn't the first. The first War okay. Games was on, I think, July 4th, 87, to be exact, in the Omni. Dusty Rhodes, the Road Warriors, Paul Ellering, and Nikita Koloff against the Horseman version with Luger. So Luger, Arn, Tully. Uh, Barry, no, nope. Luger, Arn, Tully, Ric Flair, Flair of course, and and uh, JJ Dillon. So okay. that was the first War Games. By the time we saw it, they probably had we were probably at 10 or 11 uh, overall War Games, and it was totally different guys. It was the fabulous Freebirds with the Jimmy Garvin variety. So Jimmy Garvin, Terry Bam Bam Gordy, and Michael P.S. Hayes, and Gordy, I'm sorry. Hayes and Garvin were the tag champs. I think they still did the Freebird rule, but it was pretty much Hayes. I'd love to see those photos, Alex, of, of the 89 Bash. Uh, so it was those three Freebirds were teaming up with the Samoan SWAT team, which was actually Rikichi. So, you know, the bloodline, right? The bloodline yeah. was there. And when you talk about Paul Heyman being with the bloodline, he was there. So Paul Heyman was with those guys against... Um, the Road Warriors with Paul Ellering, and they were teaming up with Steve Dr. Death Williams, who had just turned babyface again. He had just left the varsity club and was babyface. And a beautiful Bobby and Sweet Stan with Cornette. <clears throat> so you had a really weird thing where the Midnight Express with Cornette were actually tag team partners or war games partners, at least, with the Road Warriors, Hawk and Animal. And th that was like a feud all the time. Like the Midnight Express and the Road Warriors had the scaffold match in 86, right? So now you got the new guy, Stan Lane, and the Road Warriors had just beaten the Midnights 
for the tag team title in in um, October of '88, and here we are in July of '89, and they're all buddies because they all are fighting the other guys. Let's see. Uh, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> AJ, AJ has a question for me and my old pal here, Alex. Alex and Mikey, AW and Young Bucks, will talk about All In and CM Punk on Dynamite. Um, I'm not sure what the question is here, but I mean, are, is he basically saying, is there going to re- be a rebuttal from the Young Bucks to CM Punk? I mean, I think we saw Edge kind of do that. I did watch that Edge speech, which it felt very much on point or on brand for Edge. Like Edge, where Adam Copeland is trying to be like the the nice guy and take the higher ground and all that horse shit. Um, I did see another wrestling podcaster basically say like it seemed like Edge was out there waving the white flag, <laughs> begging for mercy. <laughs> like, please let us let our little company live. Don't squish us. I don't know if you saw this thing. Um, I did. I did. And and yeah. Uh, you know, I heard, I saw a lot of people say that there's no way Tony didn't send him out there to do that. Right. You know, Tony said, get out, get out there and fucking talk good about the company, you know? And, uh, yeah. And, and when the bucks came out, did you see what, what, uh, the little guy said when they came out? Actually, I did not. I'm, I'm missing this part. What are the, what happened? Yeah. Uh, we'll see. The the thing is, though, is, uh, Matt, Matt Jackson, I think. Okay, so one of the one of the bucks. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. one of the bucks. Yeah, uh, when they came out, um, I believe what he said into the camera was, uh, "Like, hey, scapegoat, uh, I love your work or something like that." But it's a little confusing because that was like the day after the CM Punk interview, right? Or two days after the CM Punk interview, right? But the scapegoat thing has been Jack Perry. He's been do, doing the thing in New Japan where he was scapegoat on his arm and he calls himself the scapegoat and stuff. So I don't know if they were talking to Jack Perry or if they were talking about CM Punk, but it was it was a little I, kind of confusing. I'm not sure. A little all, all over the place. Yeah. Um, AJ's asking for a prediction, and, and Gonzo, you can hop on this one too. Uh, the street fight with, with Bobby's group against the Final Testament. So Final Testament is Carrying Cross and the Authors of Pain. Is that it? Yeah, and, and I don't think other... I don't think it's awful at all. Okay, so you think it's good? You like it? I think I like it. Yeah. And Bobby Lashley's group is him and Montez and the other guy, the and, other street and, prophet, yeah, Angelo Dawkins. Okay, and and are they both kind of tweener factions? Are they both kind of half face, half heel type of deal? No, this Who's clear. The... the heels are the final testament. Okay. So it's kind of like this, in my opinion. It's almost like that match could go either way, and it almost depends on like the other matches, how they're booked, if you want another heel. Because you can't have all heel or face victories for the most part. So it kind of feels like, to me, I wouldn't even know who. And also it's like, do you want to start repairing and carrying cross, which I think is probably a, a factor for Triple H because he was a carrying cross guy and Vince wasn't. Um, or do you try to squeeze out another run with Lashley? And Lashley's always formidable and Lashley's always legitimate. And the Street Profits are formidable and legitimate. And the Authors of Pain can be formal. It kind of feels like, to me, Gonzo, the, the proven guys, the Street Profits more or less are proven. Bobby Lashley is really proven. And these other guys carrying cross and the authors of pain, although I think the authors of pain had some version of the tag belts in WWE, it feels like the the guy that needs it the most is carrying cross. Like 100%. like carry right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go with carrying cross. I would say he's probably not gonna pin Lashley, but if I had to choose something happening, uh, the weakest point is Dawkins. But I'll say Karrion Cross gets the pin on Montez. What do you think, Gonzo? I I, I would say Karrion Cross gets the pin on one of the Street Profits. Okay. Okay. And I'm I'm going with Montez just because the obvious thing is to get the pin on Dawkins. But I think sometimes they go a little against the grain. Like it's so obvious that Dawkins is the weak link, although he's not weak. I think Montez can take the pin and live with it. 
you want to do it right, build the final test. Exactly. They they got to build the final testament. And I think that them winning the match tomorrow night is the first step in that or, or a big step in that. I think Alex is watching more wrestling these days than I am, to tell you the truth, because he's on all this stuff. Um, they have tried a few different nests to build cross. I think they dropped the ball when Karrion Cross came out with the demolition red mask, is what I called it. When well, they that had Vince, that was a Vince thing. It was horrible when they had Karrion Cross lose to, to Jeff Hardy on Monday Night <laughs> Raw, and uh, it killed him. And killed him. they tried to get it back a week later or two weeks later. They had him win a rematch, but that whole summer I was on X or Twitter. With a guy, Kevin, Kevin, uh, something, a podcast guy, and Carrying Cross fan, and another guy that used to watch my channel was a huge Carrying Cross fan, and I'm like, they're killing this guy, and uh, yeah. people didn't want to believe it. Bailey winning, Dakota may turn on Damage Control or turn on her. I mean, I think uh, Bailey will most likely win. What do you think, Gonzo? I think Bailey, a hundred percent. It looks like there's going to be a lot of title changes tomorrow because I think I'm predicting uh, Bailey and Cody and uh, Drew to win the titles. I don't know, man. I, I st I'm still going to – I still – my gut feeling still is that Roman's going to win. <laughs> I don't know why, but that's just my gut feeling. I, I, I wouldn't doubt your gut because uh, I can see it going either way. I do feel like I think it's it's so simple to put the title on Cody, even if Roman gets it back in a month. I think that hopefully these guys don't outthink themselves and think they need to prove some type of you know postmodernism booking, like we're going to have this guy lose again. And go through another year of bullshit, and you know what I mean. Like, I don't know. We'll see. Um, yeah. If they cannot get cross, and I, I agree totally with Alex here. If they cannot get carrying crossover on this match, he's done. I, and I, I would agree with that. And I'd say that carrying cross was one of these guys who came in with the world of potential with Scarlet, the the real life smoke show, and for whatever reason, he got slaughtered on the main roster. Let's see. Um, Mikey well, was Cena the last run bad. He didn't help anyone. LA Knight was over before Cena returned, and Solo hasn't won since Cena. I don't really know the answer to that. I think I I, I would I would project this, and it could be bullshit. But I mean, John Cena conveniently came into WWE when there was an actor strike going on in Hollywood. Uh, SAG after the Screen Actors Guild. Uh, was basically on strike. I'm in that union too. And so we couldn't work in films because there's no films taking place. Legitimate union films, that is. You could work non-union. But if you're a union member, you're not supposed to. And so Cena used a loophole and him and Batista both could use it and The Rock could use it, which is wrestling is not sanctioned by any union. So the rest, these guys who are wrestlers slash actors or actors slash wrestlers could come in, have some fun, get a paycheck, and not worry about breaking union status. So that's why John Cena came in. Uh, hey, uh, let me ask you a question, and and then I'm gonna jump off after. It, but I, I want to ask you one question, uh, based off what you just said. Um, if you're in the union, are like commercials part of the union too? Like commercials yes. you see on TV? Okay, because yeah. I was just wondering because Cena's been on the Honda commercials for like two years so i didn't okay. know if they're probably running old ones that they already filmed yeah, i'm guessing exactly yeah so they from my understanding i'm just going off the top of my head on this one but if you've already filmed something like even a movie that was filmed before the uh, strike that film could still be re 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 released the actors were not supposed to promote their films even if they filmed them when there was no strike but if they were released during the strikes the actors weren't supposed to go on talk shows. And as far as commercials go, if the commercial was filmed and edited and had been broadcast, then the unions can't screw that up. They can't they can't tell the commercial producers, like, hey, pull your commercials because these actors are on strike. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, 
So I'll just fit, we're going to finish up, but we'll both finish up. MJF wants to work with Hunter. Always mention him in his promo. I know that, and you know, even when Sasha Banks said something to the effect of she's sure she'll go back to WWE at some point. I mean, she was actually being pretty honest, and I'm sure she will. I'm sure she'll go back to be in the Hall of Fame, and she'll probably do three to five years with AEW, and then come back to uh, WWE or. By the time, I mean, I don't know if she has kids or wants to have them or whatever, but I'm sure most people, you know, and I don't even think it's that big of a deal, Gonzo. I mean, I think, you know, wrestlers are supposed to come and go. That's part of the fun of wrestling is you go from one territory to the other. So I, I don't get worked up or think it's a big loyalty issue if people bounce back and forth. It's just part of being a wrestler. You know what I mean? Um, no, I agree. I agree with that, but... I think it's a little strange to sign that big fat contract and like two days later say, oh, yeah, but I'm going to go back to WWE in a couple of years. Like, don't, I mean, if I was Tony and I heard that, I'd be like, dude, what the fuck? You know, I just signed yeah. you. I, I agree with that, too. I, I do. I do agree with the sentiment. I just I think I think um, Edge or Adam Copeland, which I, I feel like they should just call him Cope. I think that would be a cool name for Adam Copeland in AEW. Cope. Like, you got to cope. I got to cope with being a wrestler. <laughs> I got to cope with all these new wrestlers in AEW. I'm sharing a locker room with Kenny Omega, and he plays video games all the time. I got to cope. Uh, Mercedes fails in AEW, and she's going for TBS championship. So who's got the TBS championship? Who's who's that champion? It's it, They've got two champions. There's... Uh, Tony Storm, oh, the, the real pretty one, Julia Hart. So I think the reason for that probably is that Julie, Julia Hart is probably more expendable than Tony Storm. Like, they're both over as heel champions. But I would suggest that Tony Storm, with her timeless gimmick, is more over by a, by a smidge than the very pretty and very young Julie Hart with the goth witch gimmick. So if Mercedes is going to scoop up a title, you take it from the younger one who's less established than Tony Storm. Julie Hart has all the time in the world to get a title back. She doesn't even need it at this point because she's, you know, she's doing very well. So I think Mercedes can scoop up that title and it's not a big loss for Julie Hart. And who knows, maybe Julia Hart will feud with her little buddy. Um, the, the other pretty one, the the big tits one, that <laughs> the self-proclaimed. So with that in mind, I guess we'll wrap this up, uh, Gonzo. But thanks to Alex, uh, AJ, uh, we had some new pals in here. You guys are welcome to copy and paste the URL. And, and, and uh, if, if you're available, Gonzo, we'll check in tomorrow night. We'll try to keep it a little shorter than this one. I know we went overtime here. But thanks for coming <laughs> up, buddy. And if there's anything you want to yeah. plug or anything you want to say, uh, go right ahead. Uh, you just you can follow me on X. Uh gonzo shark one you follow me on uh instagram the gonzo shark um and i'm in the process of uh launching a youtube so uh that'll be happening fairly soon um but you know just follow me on uh x follow me on instagram uh, but awesome. and, and tom tomorrow I, I i might be able to, to get back on tomorrow too so sweet well, we'll check in during the show, and we'll, like I said, we'll keep it shorter than tonight. But I'm glad we were here. We had fun. And uh, Mike Messier, I'm on X as Mikey Messier, Facebook Mikey Messier. This channel is One Pro Wrestling and Sports Fan. In Facebook, I run the Foreign Object Pro Wrestling Group. And uh, my other channels are One Man and a Camera Films for my films, One Mike Messier for my Mike's instant movie reviews, which are getting a little bit more popular, and so on and so forth. So thanks, Gonzo. Thanks, everybody, for checking in. We'll see you tomorrow night. All right. Later.